fun out there. Yes. All right. Well, we are at two o'clock, so I'm going to get started. I just posted a link to the handout for today's session in the chat. Um, it was also emailed out in the reminder email. Uh, I just have a couple of quick announcements before we get started. So hello and welcome everyone to our Find Your Ancestors session for today. Today we're going to be talking about researching institutionalized ancestors. I'm Katie Stope. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library. And for those who aren't familiar with where Appleton is, we're just south of Green Bay. So we're Thank you for joining us from all around the world today. Um, I, like I said, I just have a few quick announcements. Um, first, I would just like to thank the Friends of the Appleton Public Library for providing funding for this series. They've been really awesome and letting us get tons of great speakers. So thank you to the Friends of the Appleton Public Library. Uh, for those unfamiliar with our Find Your Ancestors series, this happens once a month, every month. Um, so definitely check out the handout, um, which has a couple links to our upcoming sessions. We have um, up to April scheduled for next year. Um, so like I said, I posted the handout link in the chat and are posted a couple times throughout our session today. Our next session is January 15th, and we're going to have genealogist Angie Knutson, and she's going to be discussing the various genealogy programs that there are, um, you know, as well as the digital sites that you can host your tree on, um, kind of going through the pros and cons and discussing each to figure out what's the best for you to, you know, you work on your family tree on. So uh, you can see the link in the handout to register for that program, and it's going to be virtual on Zoom, of course. Um, as I said, you know, check out our other 2022 programs for Find Your Ancestors. We have up to April book. We have some really great topics, including breaking down your brick walls with one of Lee's colleagues, uh, Lori Bessler from the Wisconsin Historical Society. So that will be an awesome one. She is great. Um, we're also going to be talking about Norwegian ancestors and Civil War genealogy. So lots of great topics coming up next year. And um, just so you're aware, if you do register for the programs now, we will send you a reminder email a week before and a day before the program. So even if you forget to mark it on your calendar, you'll still get that reminder. Of course, if you've missed any of our past programs, we do try to record the ones that we are able to. So check out our YouTube channel. Uh, there is a link for that in the handout. Of course, we aren't able to record everything or keep it on there indefinitely. Um, so try to join us live if you're able to or watch the recording as soon as possible before they get taken down. So. If you have any questions today during today's session, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type in your question and then we'll answer those at the end of the session. We also have closed captioning enabled, um, so you should be able to view that. If you would like to turn it off, you're welcome to click that closed captioning button and it'll turn off. Um, just be aware that they're not 100% accurate since it's a live transcript. All right, so at the end of today's session, there is going to be a short survey that pops up when you close out of Zoom. It's through Project Outcome, which is an American Library Association initiative. It's just a quick eight question survey. If you have a minute or two to answer it for us, give us some feedback on today's session and let us know what you thought. We appreciate it. And just be aware that those are anonymous surveys. So if you have a question or want something that you want followed up on, you have to list your email or your names so that I know how to follow up with you. Otherwise they're completely anonymous and I can't answer questions that you post in those surveys unless I know who to answer them to. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. Today we have Lee Grady. He is the Senior Reference Archivist at the Wisconsin Historical Society. He has a master's degree, master's degrees in American History and Library and Information Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he has been on staff at the Historical Society for over 25 years and has a wide range of experience with the Society's archival collections. So everyone, welcome Lee. Thanks very much, Katie. Um, yes, I am senior reference archivist, um, and that mainly just means I'm old and I've been here a long time. Um, I have white hair. I'm actually the only reference archivist here at the Wisconsin Historical Society, so I guess I, by default, I'm senior. I, we were supposed to have another one, but we haven't. The position hasn't been filled for like five years, so basically, I'm I'm the only one here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about institutional records for genealogy at the WHS archives. So by default, it's institutionalized ancestors for whom we have records here at the Historical Society. But a lot of what I'm going to say, I think, is going to be applicable to institutionalized ancestors that might be in other states or other kinds of facilities that aren't 
uh, covered in our collections here because they, my experience is that there's a lot of common threads um, in the kinds of records that you'll find in uh, for institutionalized ancestors. If we were in person here, I would ask people to um, raise their hands if they've been to the Wisconsin Historical Society before, but I'm not in person, so I have no idea if anybody's even listening to me right now. Oh, I see that there's, oh yeah, I guess you can virtually raise hands. Hey, excellent. I see, I see participants raising virtual hands now, and many people have been to the Historical Society. That's great. Um, between the library and archives here, we're one of the better uh, North American genealogical collections. Um, so even if you're not um, from Wisconsin, we'll have a, a lot of records, especially in our library, which has things like birth, death, and marriage records and um, newspapers from around North America and um, all the genealogy databases and, and lots of um, other resources. I work in the archives, so our, our library has published things like newspapers and the databases. We have original paper records here, and we're unusual at the Historical Society um, uh, in that in the archives, we have both state government and local government records, and we have manuscripts. So we're the state archives for Wisconsin, so we have records from 71 of the 72 counties in the state. The one county we generally don't have is Milwaukee, and that's because the statutes specify that counties that reach a certain population level are responsible for their own records, and Milwaukee is the only one that has reached that level at this point. So we have the other 71 counties. Milwaukee County records are often found at the Milwaukee County Historical Society. So local government records, we have, we also have state government records uh, be Governor's papers going back to territorial days, records of state agencies like the DNR and Department of Transportation, and a lot of state institutions that I'll talk about. Um, but we also have manuscripts, private manuscripts in the same place. So if people have donated their papers to us, maybe family papers, maybe Civil War diaries and letters, maybe uh, letters of soldiers from other wars, or just family collections, um, organizations uh, such as, um, you know, nonprofits, um, journalists, politicians, papers. Uh, so manuscripts are included as well as state government and local government records. And we're even more unusual for a state historical society. And, and this might have to do with our relationship with the University of Wisconsin. We serve as one of the, as one of the university libraries on campus. We're responsible for North American history. So our collections go well beyond the state of Wisconsin. As I mentioned, our, our library in particular has a newspaper collection that's second only really to the Library of Congress in terms of the number of newspapers they have and periodicals from around the, from uh, for North America. And um, they have a lot of ge national genealogical collections. In the archives, we specialize in things. We have things like we're one of the top places in the country to study the history of Hollywood film, Hollywood movies and theater. So you want to see an original script for the movie Casablanca or costume designs, original costume designs for Alfred Hitchcock movies. Um, believe it or not, you know, you can come to the Wisconsin Historical Society and find that. Also, the American Civil Rights Movement is, is a strength of ours. Um, mass communication, so lots of journalists, papers. And so don't, you know, don't count us out. If, um, if you have an ancestor who uh, worked in Hollywood movies, for example, there, there you go. You could, you could, you should try contacting us because you never know what, what you'll find here. But today I'm here to tell you about institutional records and most of those are county and state records that we have. So it's part of our state archives function. I'm gonna start off by talking about county records and then and give you some examples and then talk about state gov or state institutions, I'll give you some examples of that and then wrap it up and hopefully have, I'm told I have up to two and a half hours even, but don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to go that long, um, but I'll leave time for questions. I usually have trouble running up against time limits, um, but I, I doubt that I will when I'm talking to my own computer screen here. If I, if I had a room full of you to um, ask questions and raise your hand and or look confused or to, you know, talk to, I think I could go on longer, but this is a different environment. So. I'm going to start with county records. Um, oh, this is my genealogical. I, you know what I didn't mention was um, 
besides things in the, I, I didn't mention the genealogical resources we have in the archives. So I think I'm gonna start, I'm gonna give you a little quick overview of that. So this is in addition to things like the institutional records that I'm gonna to talk to you about. Um, so we have the local government records include things like naturalization records, probate, other kinds of court records, school records in some cases. Uh, we have for state records, the most commonly accessed genealogical sources are things like civil war um, service records because Civil War units were managed by state governments. We have official service records for Civil War soldiers from Wisconsin. We also have a set of service records from World War I for um, Wisconsin soldiers. And that's significant because most of the World War I and World War II service records at the National Archives were lost in a fire, as you probably know, uh, several years ago. Well, we have copies of the records for Wisconsin soldiers that were made right after the war by the state. So we have World War I service records and then licensing records, which uh, people, a lot of people don't know about, but the state of Wisconsin licensed lots of professions, um, midwives, private detectives, wrestlers and boxers, in addition to the ones that you would expect like teachers and, and nurses. So we have a lot of licensing records. If you have ancestors who you think might've been a, in one of those professions starting around the 19 teens or so, by all means, contact us. Uh, we, we, we might have a licensing application file or something like that. Uh, maps are really commonly used. I do a whole presentation on maps. Maybe someday I could do it um, for this group. Uh, but you, you're probably familiar with uh, plat maps. We have plat maps for uh, every county in Wisconsin, uh, show land ownership, uh, but also lots of counties and states uh, outside of Wisconsin. And then the map collection is really, uh, again, North American in scope. And one of our earliest maps we have is from 1513, one of the first to show North America. So just to give you an idea of the scope of our map collection. And I should mention the Area Research Center Network too, because those local government records like the, the county naturalization records, they're often scattered around the state at our area research centers. So we have area research centers at UW system campuses, Green Bay, Stevens Point, um, Platteville, Whitewater, you know, you get the idea. And a lot of the counties around those area research centers, um, nationalization records from those counties are found at those area research centers. So for example, Brown County or uh, Outagamie County naturalizations are likely to be at UW Green Bay Area Research Center. Winnebago County is gonna be at Oshkosh and so forth. We have Dane, Columbia and Sauk County naturalizations and other kinds of court and local government records here in Madison. And those are the ones that I deal with the most. Okay, so now we are gonna to go to institutional records and I'm gonna start with county records. And these, what you see on the screen here, and I, and I think I sent a handout, which I hope you all have available. I think it was in the uh, link, among the links that Katie sent out to you before the presentation. Uh, there's a handout that has a lot of these, so you don't have to write it down or do a screenshot or anything. Um, this is what you're seeing here are the types of county institutions for which we have some records. And then the counties that you see after that are the counties that we have records from, at least some records. And I should specify, we have at least some inmate records or records that would be of interest to genealogists. In some cases we might have, for example, just administrative records for a poorhouse or, or a sanitarium, meaning like you know records from the, the director or the manager about how the place was run and the finances, but doesn't have anything about the actual patients or inmates of that institution. So I eliminated those, or I didn't mention those because um, we're focused on genealogy here. Most counties, you know, when you're dealing with county records, there's a lot of gaps and most counties in the state had things like jails. I would say probably a majority of them had their own poorhouses and asylums, but we only have records for some of them. Uh, what happened to the other records that we don't have? Uh, if you've dealt with county records or, you know, gone to archives like ours in the past, you'll have discovered that there are inexplicable gaps everywhere. Uh, you might, even if you find records for a particular county, say a county poorhouse like Brown County, there'll be pieces missing, dates missing, um, types of records missing. It has to do with the haphazard way that local government records have been kept for many years. Um, Wisconsin did not have a records law, a state archives law until the 1940s. So before that, 
if a county needed some more space because they were clearing out, you know, adding some offices or moving to a different building, they could just throw away whatever they thought they didn't need anymore. Uh, there were no laws to keep them from doing that. There's no process that were by which they would automatically offer them to us. There is now a process like that, but there wasn't at the time. So a lot of records just disappeared. Um, there might be times when, when counties offered us records and we didn't take them. Um, that's especially true of things like orphanages where there are statutory restrictions on them and you know, it makes it hard to provide access to them. And we might've said, well, since we can't provide access uh, um, and there's some legal difficulties with those records, we might not take them. So there's a lot of different reasons for why we might not have one county, but we have other counties just the way it is. But doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, send me an email. I, I should have pointed out when I first started that my email address was on the um, first slide. It'll be on the last slide too, so don't worry. It's probably on the handout. I'm sure it's on the handout that, that you guys have. Uh, but send me an email. That's what I do. I answer a lot of emails besides working with people who come into our reading room in person. I was working on emails before I, I talked to you today, and I'll work on emails after um, after I, I stop talking to you. And um, the more, the better, right? Keep sending them in. Actually, I should have put Lori Bessler's email in there instead of mine, now that I think of it. Um, she's my colleague in the library. She gets she spends a lot of time answering emails too. Um, so even if you don't see your county on the list here, send, you, you know, and you have an ancestor you find that was in a poorhouse or asylum, go ahead and send it to our reference email. And, and I have, sometimes I can refer you to other places or give you some ideas of where you might look if uh, there's still possible that the records still exist. So poor houses, asylums and hospitals, sanitariums for tuberculosis, orphanages, jails. Let me give you an example of a poor house and an asylum. Often they were combined. So a lot of counties combine their, their poor houses and their, in, quote, insane asylums. That's the case in Dane County. This is a photo of Dane County Asylum and Poor Farm. And we have these, uh, some records from the Dane County Asylum and Poor Farm here in Madison. There's a Winnebago County um, Poor Farm and Asylum, and some of those records are at UW Oshkosh Area Research Center. And um, they, these poor house records are like a lot of institutional records. This is a great example because almost all of these institutions, one of the basic records they kept was who is coming into the place and who is leaving and why are they coming in and some basic information about everybody who's arriving at the poor house or at the asylum. And a common type of record for us to have for institutions is these are these admission logs or admission registers. They're often they're like this one is a large ledger volume. You open the pages, people are in the register in date order of the order of when they arrived at the place. So they're like an intake volume. Somebody arrives and the person at the counter asks them questions uh, about why they're there and their background and records some information. So it's a log of when they arrive. And then often they would keep another register of when they leave. Sometimes this is the only thing we have. Um, for Dane County uh, Hospital and Home, this is one of the main records. We have a few other scattered things, but this is one of the, the main record. And for a lot of people, it's the only record we have of them. One of the challenges is that they're, because they're in date order, uh, there's no often no alphabetical index or a way to look up somebody by name. So we, I always ask somebody when they say, I have an ancestor who I think was in the Dane County Asylum or the Dane County Poorhouse, my first question is, do you know when they might've arrived? And often you, genealogists don't know uh, because they found it maybe in a census record. They found out, oh yeah, well in the 1900 census, they're in there. Uh, the census was taken maybe in June, but I don't know when they arrived. Was it five years previous? Was it a month previous or a few days previous? It makes it a little challenging. Um, we can we can look through admission logs like this for a few years worth. You know, we can't look through ten years worth. Uh, we don't have the staff to do that. Uh, if you visited in person, there are cases where you could look through the volume yourself if you're not sure when somebody arrived. So often I'll say, well, give me your best guess when somebody might have arrived there. If all you have is the census, when you know when you were there, we'll start with that date and work our way back and see if we can find them just by paging through it day by day. Uh, the re information recorded on here, you may or may not be able to see on your screen. I don't know how large your screens are. I even have trouble in mine and have a pretty big monitor here. Uh, but it gives the, they assign a number to the person, uh, gives their name, their age, the date they've arrived, the date they were released or left the poorhouse, 
um, their nationality. In this case, these are Norwegians, um, or the first people on the list are Norwegians. So this is a family. Actually, the first four people here are a family. Isabella Olsen um, arrived January 15th, 1855 with her two children and another relative. I'm not sure how the other relative person is related. They're 21 years old, but the children are 10 and three years old. They're, and they're from Deerfield, Wisconsin. And it says the reason for their quote, pauperism, so why they're in the poor house is because it says crazy husband. Um, I don't know if that means the husband was clinically or literally crazy or whether that's just what she said when she went there and they asked her, why are you here? And she said, my husband's crazy. That could be, because then it says for the children, crazy father, crazy father. So it says that's, that's the only reason given. As you look down this list, if you could read it, the other reasons that people are here, I see old age, I have someone who's blind, um, I have someone who has a broken rib, so they were injured, there's no workman's compensation in 1855, um, there's a guy who has frozen feet, he's a um, bohemian farmer maybe, or no, he's a carpenter, and so somehow he got frostbite, I, I assume, and is not able to walk, he's disabled, and now he's got to spend some time in the poorhouse. I can't see exactly how long he was there for a couple of months. Anyway, this is the kind of, sometimes this is the end of the line, but it's interesting information. You, you learn a little bit about the family. You get a little bit of um, information about uh, how long they were here. Um, in some cases, some of the institutions we have, there's more after that. But in a lot of cases, this is, this is what we end up with is, is sort of a admission log or admission record, basic admission record. Um, so Dane County had a poorhouse and it had a separate ledger. There was another separate ledger for its um, insane asylum part or the asylum part of the Dane County facility. And we have ledgers, same similar kind of log or ledger for that. Um, some counties had hospitals. Typically the people that ended up um, in the asylums and hospitals that were county run or state run are people who couldn't afford private care. So let's say you have someone with a terminal illness or a really serious um, illness um, or a mental illness and they can't afford a private hospital, they might um, be taken on as a ward of the county, paid for by the county and sent to a county, county hospital or asylum. Sometimes people were transferred in between these places. So they might start off at like Brown County Asylum. And then after a while, Brown County, maybe they're getting too many patients or the case of the person is is have some has some difficulty that they can't deal with at the county hospital, so they would transfer them to the state hospital at Mendota, for example. And so we'll we can follow a trail there, and somebody ends up at Mendota after having been at Brown or Crawford or one of these um, county institutions. So it's like a network, really, of of government institutions. They could start off at the county, go back to the go to the state, be transferred back to the county, go home, then be readmitted again. There are people that that have that sort of uh, pattern, or they could have just been there for um, you know a short time and never there again. The other thing I've observed over time is that the people who end up at places like the asylums, because there was no separate hospice care, and you know for for people who couldn't afford private care, and you had a terminal illness, for example, there's a lot of older people that have are terminally ill. And they would be sent to an asylum. Even you know, if there wasn't a separate hospital, they might be sent to the uh, the insane asylum just to have some care um, until they died, uh, which might be a month or two. Um, of course, sometimes you know, terminal illnesses have dementia or other kinds of symptoms that might be interpreted as mental illness. But it was much more than just mental illness as we would define it today. Um, there were people who had um, al were alcoholics. There were people who were epileptics. Um, that you know that have physical problems too that that aren't we wouldn't think of as as mental health problems. Multiple sclerosis is another one I've seen. Uh, people ended up at at the one of these asylums because that was the only place for them, and the family couldn't afford to take care of them or didn't have the resources. They ended up in in the county and state system. Uh, sanitariums. Wisconsin is known was known for its sanitariums uh, in the era of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, also known as consumption, um, is a popular term for it, was a scourge uh, before antibiotics, before World War II. Uh, it, was, it was a top killer of people. 
and it is a disease that people could live with for years um, before they died um, and be put in a sanitarium for a while and then come out again and be put back in. Um, and this, the reason for the sanitarium is to separate people so they're not, con, you know, con infecting others, but also for long-term care if they became more or less disabled by the disease. Wisconsin was a destination because of the cold weather was part of it. And sort of like the, a lot of sanitariums were in rural areas where there were forests. You know, we had a lot of forests in rural areas which were thought to be healthy, clean air. And also the cold was thought to be therapeutic, although usually it was the dry cold air was thought to be better. So there were a lot of mountain sanitariums too. Um, in Wisconsin though, there, there were lots of county run tuberculosis sanitariums. There were private sanitariums. Uh, patients would, one of the therapies was to have people lay out on cots um, out on porches in the cold air, in the winter, they'd be bundled up to stay warm. But the, the, the idea was that breathing the cold air was therapeutic. Uh, they had unheated cottages often that were connected by tunnels to the main buildings so that people again could sleep in these unheated cottages. They thought that that was um, good for patients. Uh, that's, that's why one of the reasons Wisconsin had so many of them, I guess. But we only have records for a couple sanitariums um, for whatever reason. Again, it might be the medical record issue that I, I said before that because records, healthcare records have restrictions on them, you know, we have some statutory ability to provide access. The Historical Society does as a state, as the state archives, if they're older than 75 years. But a lot of times counties, you know, and governments, um, they don't trust us with the records for one thing. I mean, they're used to security, especially in the modern era. They're, they're, worse, they're used to the confidentiality and the privacy and protecting those. And they know that we are used to providing access to records here. That's what our job is. And maybe they don't trust us to, to administer them properly. Or again, maybe we understand that because they're closed um, or they can be closed for a long time, um, we're reluctant to take them. For whatever reason, we, we've only got a couple of sanitarium records, Jefferson and Marathon County. Orphanages, even more so. We have only one that I know of, Racine County. Um, we have some administrative records for other orphanages, but. Um, Racine is the only county institution that we have. And that one in particular, because it has to do with kids and because there's a lot of adoptions that are in those orphanage records, a lot of adoption records, and those are really locked down in Wisconsin. It doesn't matter how old they are. They could be 200, well, 150 years old and they're still locked down. I cannot provide access to them under any circumstances. So if I run across any record um, in our collection that says a kid was adopted, I refer people to the adoption record search program run by the state of Wisconsin. And under certain circumstances, they will allow you to have access. You have to submit an application. Um, but orphanage records are so locked down that we have not, we've rarely taken them. And so we've got this one example in Racine County. There are some that are still run, you know, some of those orphanages that were run by churches, those records might still exist. I know of Green Bay, for example, Green Bay's the Catholic diocese in Green Bay has some records of St. Joseph's Orphanage in Green Bay, which was a Catholic organization. And I, I, I've heard from people that they've successfully gone to them and, and gotten records of uh, orphans who were at St. Joseph's. So it's not, all hope is not lost. I mean, some of those records were destroyed, but some of the church run organizations, you might still be able to find those, especially the Catholic church, which is really good at, but it's been really good at keeping their own records. Finally, jails, uh, another thing that Every county probably had. We have records and scattered records um, from several counties, but you know, look at that list and there are 72 counties in the state and we have only a handful. Uh, Dane County, we have a really good set of records for and I'll show you an example from Dane County. And here's a, a photo of the Dane County Jail in 1901. And here's a jail register, very similar. I, I, it looks different, but the idea is the same as that poorhouse register I showed you uh, where they just keep a log of who's arriving in the jail every day, why they're there, a little bit about them, what's their occupation, their age, their gender, their uh, where they were born or where they're from and who brought them there and then when they leave. Now, the jails are, and, and for Dane County, by the way, just a fantastic, I can't remember what the, what the run is, but it's something like 18 
you know, 70s all the way to the 1950s or something like that. So it's a, it's a really long run of these jail registers, which is fantastic. The downside is that jail populations are even more transitory than, say, like a asylum or a, a tuberculosis sanitarium or, or a prison. In those cases, somebody might be there for several years. So there's a much better chance that you'll catch them in a census, for example, like in the 1910 census, they might be in the state prison. Finding somebody in the census who happens to be in, in jail during that time is a lot tougher because especially in those days, people might only spend a day or two in jail. They weren't there waiting trial for a year or two years like it might happen today, I don't think. Um, when I look through these registers, people are only there usually overnight or just for a few days. So catch, catching them in a census is really tough. There's no alphabetical index. You kind of have to know the date you're looking for. You have to have an idea that they even were in jail. It's not the kind of thing, as I'll talk about later when we talk about prison records, it's not the kind of thing that is shared in family lore. You know, you're not likely to hear grandma tell you about how grandpa was in jail for a while or whatever, you know, so you have no idea they were in jail. Sometimes I have people who find it in newspapers. Now with digital newspapers, you might do a digital newspaper search and find that a paper will often say so-and-so was arrested and sent to jail for, you know, if it's some minor crime, it likely was jail rather than prison. And um, then you have a day to go by with a, with a newspaper. You can say, hey, I saw a newspaper article that my grandpa was, or my uncle was sent to jail or was convicted, you know, convicted of, a, arrested for a crime on, you know, December 11th in 1930 or something, and may, then we can check to see if we have a, a jail register for that city or that county and look for that time period and then see if they're in there. Um, so what you're looking at here is a jail page from a couple pages from the jail register. It's again, it's, a, it's an old ledger volume. I'm looking away because I have it on the right, my right monitor here. So you have to look at the side of my head for a bit here, but 1883 is what it's from. And uh, list their name, their uh, gender, their age, uh, where they were born. Uh, I, see, I see Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, France, Germany, Poland, uh, then where they're, where they're living, Madison, Oregon, which is Oregon, Wisconsin. If you're local here, you'll know that that's very close by here. Uh, then their occupation, I see a farmer, laborer, innkeeper, janitor, so forth. And then the reason that they're brought in, vagrancy is a common one. So just sort of homeless or drunk or whatever. Um, I see the two innkeepers are there because they made threats either to each other or to somebody else. It doesn't say those are the two guys that were born in France. Um, seduction, is, that's interesting. Um, so get the eyes very similar to the kinds of reasons that you might be in jail today, but the, also the kinds of charges that Likely you're only there for a day or two, you know, maybe if you're drunk, it's overnight, you spend the night in jail. And then it has on the bottom part of the page when they were released and under what circumstances, sometimes it's by court order. A lot of them say by court order, they're, they're released or the sentence was only for a day or whatever, they completed their sentence. Um, again, you know, interesting. I I'm sure I have had ancestors that have been in county jails and I have no idea and if you don't find them in the newspaper, I think the only way I can think of to find somebody in here is let's say you have roots in a family. Let's say you have a lot, of, a lot of family that were in Dane County, you know, during the late night, during the 19th and early 20th century, and you had the time and you wanted to visit us here, uh, which all of you, if I haven't said it before, are welcome to visit. We're open eight to five Monday through Friday and nine to four Saturday. We've been open a lot of, a lot of the pandemic too, um, by appointment for a while because of, because of COVID, but now we're, we're back, we've been for many months now back um, to our full open hours. Uh, you don't need an appointment. You can come in and sit down and look through the Dane County Jail Register. And if you have a lot of family, extended family for many, many years in Dane County, who knows, you might find some relatives who had to spend some time in the jail just by paging through here um, or some other kind of extended family members. And as I'll say with the prison records, I mean, I know it's a mixed bag. Uh, I, I help a lot of genealogists who find family members who were in prison or in jail um, and they didn't know it. And yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of a bummer that they were in jail but or in prison, but as long as it's not too serious of a, of a crime, it, it's more records, right? I mean, if you're a genealogist, it's probably kind of a, you kind of pump your fist a little bit because you got some more records, um, even though, you know, maybe they, 
they committed a crime or something. Um, and it's one of the few places where some of those people were besides the usual like birth, death and marriage records and those kind of vital records, you know, any extra bonus stuff about that gives you shed some light on the person or their family or their circumstances or occupation is kind of helpful, right? So jail records, that's a good example. All right, I'm gonna move on to state now, taking a glance at the, the clock here because I don't wanna, you know, the good thing about, I, I probably told you before, I, I, I I don't like, I'm not really a big fan of the virtual presentation because I have no idea, you know, maybe what if I've lost my connection and I'm not talking to anybody right now? Although I do see that the chat, there's still people in the chat, there's lots of things. So I know that there's people still out there, but I really like to be able to interact with people. And um, <laughs> I can't, it's, it's just something to just keep talking into the screen like this without um, knowing if anybody's here or not. Um, so where was I? State, state records, state records. All right. So I'm going to move on to state records here. And, and I know that there, I see that there's, there's questions that have been answered, asked to and, and hands that have been raised. And I'm trusting that Katie will take care of that if, and, and we'll, we'll deal with it at the end. Um, and oh, what I was going to say was one good thing about this, um, besides not having to travel in the bad weather, this virtual stuff is that, you know, if you're getting tired of what I'm saying or getting bored or whatever, you can look at your phone, you can get up and go get something to drink, get something from the refrigerator. And I have no idea. I, I think I'm gonna try and imagine all of you raptly paying attention right now. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, all right, state government records. I said we were the state archives. Um, just quickly here, you can see the list, prison records, mental hospitals, orphanages, and then a few other kinds of institutions. This is not all of the kinds of state institutions there were. Uh, it's just that these are the ones for which we have some records of inmates or of patients or of people uh, who may have been in those institutions with one exception that I'll get to in a minute. Um, these are all things for which I can point you to records that we have here. By all means though, send those emails. And you know, even if I don't have stuff like this on the list, I've been doing this a long time. So I might've heard of other places to look. I might give you some ideas. Um, if it's a federal kind of facility, you know, National Archives, obviously, sometimes county counties, and, and there's other places that you might look. And again, court records in almost every one of these cases, local government records and these state institutions, a lot of these people were committed there by judges, and there are probably court records. So obviously, that's true with criminal records with uh, someone that goes to the state prison, they had a criminal court case, and there might be a, a paper trail there for the actual court proceedings. But even the poorhouses and the insane asylums, people were often committed by judges. Kids were put in state in the state orphanage, for example, by judge's order. And there might be a court record um, at the county level. And I, I can point you in the right direction, uh, even if we don't have the records. Um, and, and there might still be hope, even if we don't have the particular institution records um, that are relevant. So the first example I wanna give you um, is a prison record. And uh, before I dive into the state prison here, uh, state prison was built or began in 1851. I think they were in temporary buildings for a while and then they built some permanent structures, some of which are still there. 1851, um, it's still there now, it's, at, it's in Waupun. Um, we have records, we have a really complete set of records for anybody who was actually at the prison itself from 1851 to 1997. Uh, so at least a basic record for everybody. Uh, women were included up to about 1940. Uh, after that, it's all men. There was a separate women's prison at Techita that was built in 1921. We have some records, you can see the dates. Those dates there are the, are the dates that we have good records for. for. Um, Home for Women, uh, School for Boys and School for Girls, your classic reform schools um, for, for juveniles. And again, you know, you can't make too many assumptions about why people were at any of these institutions. It, it, it's the same thing I said with the asylums, that the reasons that somebody might be in a mental institution or an asylum like a type institution today are different than they were back then. Um, same with, um, uh, prison. There are people, there are many people in the state prison that I've run across who are there for writing a bad check. Um, there are women who are in prison because they had a child out of wedlock um, and were charged with adultery. I mean, there, there are all kinds of reasons that people are there that, 
you just probably wouldn't see today. And with a school for boys and school for girls, sometimes it's just a matter of them not having parents to take care of them, being sort of on the street, um, and they get sent, or what it, people call incorrigible. I've seen many children who were sent, teenagers especially, who were sent to the school for boys and school for girls because their parents uh, decided they were incorrigible, meaning they, they weren't listening to them. They weren't, you know, they were hard to discipline. So they could go to a judge and, and uh, you know, the child, in the cases I've seen, they weren't even allowed to testify on their own behalf. The parent would just say, they hang out with bad other bad kids and they don't listen to me and they would send them to the school for boys or they could send them to the school for boys or school for girls. So um, we have some records from both of those institutions. And then um, in the 1940s, the Department of Corrections started to centralize their record keeping. So uh, before that, it's institution dependent. So they we have records from the state prison, from the state reformatory, from and that's a, I didn't mention that, but that's in Green Bay, another um, mostly male correctional facility that started in 1898. Women, boys, girls. So it was, we have records if we have records from the institution and if they were in one of those institutions. After the 40s, corrections centralized those things. So that means that even if they were just on parole or no matter what institution they were in, there was a central record keeping system. So there might be a sort of just basic record for them, in some cases, maybe a case file. So they didn't necessarily even have to be in an instit institution. They could have been on probation and there might be a record for them after about 1948 is what it was. Um, so the record kind of records landscape changes, the kinds of uh, records we have and how to find them changes. And don't worry about how to find them because again, that's, um, I'm just telling you this stuff so you know it exists and you know the possibilities because ultimately you'll have to contact us and we'll have to help you um, help you along the way. It's just it, there each each one of these has its own sort of approach for finding things, different kinds of indexes or there's no indexes at all. There's all kinds of tricks that take years that and these tricks take years to learn. So send me that email, you know, stop in if you're able to come in in person and we'll help you we'll help you walk walk through it. So with that said, I'm going to show you this example from the state prison, the oldest institution. Here's a photo of the state prison at Waupun. Uh, again, some of the original buildings date from the 1850s. Um, this photo is from 1893. Impressive looking building. And again, some of those impressive, little, impressive looking buildings are still there. Some of my colleagues in the state records part of our operation have, have had the um, privilege of, of taking a tour of those those buildings. I haven't been able to get there yet. I'd love to take a tour of those buildings. It'd be fascinating. Um, here's a shot of a newly constructed cell block as of 1893 as well at the prison. So as I mentioned before, a common way people, um, genealogists will find that an ancestor was in one of these institutions is through the census or sometimes through a newspaper article. Um, I have an example here of a guy named um, Delos Stoddard. That's a great, unusual first name. And as you, as I know, genealogists love unusual names because um, they're much easier to find when you're doing searching. But Delos Stoddard, so it's a guy from Darlington. There's two different ways you could figure out, assuming again that your family, you know, you're not sitting around the table at Thanksgiving and and suddenly, you know, Grandma Burns blurts out that Uncle Delos was in Waupun. Uh, in the 19, in, in the 1930s, because again, that's in my experience in my family, and definitely there are people that were in institutions like this in my family. Nobody talked about it, and I, I had no idea until I accidentally stumbled across them, say in the census. So, Dalo Stoddard, if you searched the 1940 census, you would say maybe you'd be surprised that he was in Wapan because you didn't know anybody was living in Wapan, and then you'd notice that he's listed as an inmate as his occupation, and it has a number there. The number 21163 is his prisoner number, along with all the other prisoners that are that are there. They, they, they enumerated them in the census, just like anybody else. And all of the institutions that I'm talking about, there was no consideration for privacy in terms of that. So if you were, even if you were an orphan in an, in a, an orphanage, you're listed in the census. I mean, you're listed in the census if you're in the insane, insane asylum, of course, those records weren't available at the time just to anybody, So, but they're available now uh, up to 1940. 
So De La Stoddard, you might've run across him in a census. Of course, that doesn't tell you when he was arrived at the prison, but it at least tells you that he was there as of 1940, um, doing a newspaper search in a digital newspaper. Great thing about digital newspapers. Newspaper Archive in Wisconsin um, has a great collection of uh, digital newspapers and newspapers.com also has a, a collection of digital newspapers for Wisconsin. As you probably know, it's not anywhere near complete. Uh, newspapers.com and newspaper archive don't include, uh, at least in our subscriptions, don't include uh, Green Bay, don't include Milwaukee, don't include a lot of cities, and there's a lot of dates missing. But a lot of places are included, including the State Journal in Madison, and that's where I found this, uh, Wisconsin State Journal, 1933. Delo Stoddard from Darlington was sentenced to four to 12 years in Waupon Saturday by a circuit court judge. Again, there's a reference to those criminal court records. Um, and you have the date was July 22nd, so that gives you a nice piece of information to look for records um, related to Delos Stoddard and his time at Waupon. Then let's say you find that, and a lot of people will contact the prison because Waupon, the state prison, is still there. And you can do that, um, but they will refer you to us because they, uh, by now they've transferred almost everything they have for that time period to us. Uh, everything that survived. So we have some basic records. They'll they'll refer you to us, or you could contact us directly, um, ask archives at wisconsinhistory.org. Again, that's on the handout and it'll be on the last slide. Um, you contact us, and then the first thing I do, um, Wapon is great because we actually have an alphabetical card index, um, and the cards have some good information in, the, in and of themselves. And this is the card, the prisoner card uh, we have for Delo Stoddard, and it gives me that same prisoner number, 21163, that you saw in the prisoner record. By the way, that's another great piece of information. The census had his prisoner number in it, so that's that'll that's a key to all the other records we have for Wapon are by prisoner number, so that number is key. It's important, and um, it's on the card here, but you see the card also has lots of other great information. Uh, it has, you know, the court, Jefferson County, that he was uh, sentenced in, uh, the crime, the date he was sent, and that the date he also arrived, which was the same day. He arrived at the prison the same day he was sentenced by the court. Um, it also has some um, aliases. So apparently he had been arrested previously under some fake names. Donald Kent and Fred Moser are two names he used. Uh, it gives you a previous record. He was arrested in Janesville for speeding in 1926 and was fined $10 in costs. Uh, he was arrested for stealing a car in Broadhead in 1926, did 16 months at WSR, that, that's the state reformatory. So there's a clue. He was at the state reformatory too, and we have some records for the state reformatory. So when I see this, I jot it down and, and note that we're going to have to look for state reformatory records too, in addition to state prison stuff for a previous crime. Gives you some uh, stuff about you know his age, his he's a farm hand is his occupation, his mother's name, stepmother's name is Alice, father's name is Nelson, he has brothers named Stanley and Bernard, so it gives you some family information. Got his sisters' names with their married names, that's great, Prudence Bolin and Margaret Kilkelly. So if you didn't know the sisters' um, married names, there they are. He's Methodist, his religion is tenth grade education. He's a moderate drinker or a user of liquor or drugs. Um, you know, has places there. He doesn't have venereal disease. That's good. Um, says notify his father in case of emergency or if they need to notify a family member. On the back side of the card, you have um, the judge was Charles Grimm. Uh, it's a second offense. Uh, you know, he's white, 25 years old, Darlington again, sheet metal worker. So it said before it gave a different occupation, right? Farmhand. So that's interesting. Both farm, he's been a farmhand and a sheet metal worker at various times. Oh, he's trade as a street metal, street metal worker, I see, and his occup last occupation was farm worker. Um, so great information. If this is all you had, this would be pretty good. Um, for some years, um, another common record we have is their conduct record. So that's basically a log of how good of a prisoner they were, from the at least from the prison official's point of view. They Every time they uh, had a rule, <clears throat> excuse me, a rule infraction, they got written up on their conduct record, and this is Delo Stoddard's conduct record. We have these on microfilm. You veteran genealogists will recognize this as characteristic microfilm. It's really kind of a flat looking thing, black and white. I mean, it's great that we kept it. Um, it's a lot more fun to look at 
the original paper records. Um, microfilm is nobody's favorite, but at least we have it. So this is a microfilm record of his conduct record. I don't know if you can read it, but you can see it re up at the top. It kind of runs through his crimes again or his conviction and some of the basic dates. But then that list, that report, that list underneath are all these rule infractions that he had. <clears throat> and I can tell from these rule infractions that Delos Stoddard was a chatty, friendly kind of fellow. He liked to talk to people because almost all of his rule infractions were talking and laughing. So I see here like um, running through the list, talking in school, talking in school, talking on range, it looks like, talking in school again, continued talking, that's great, listed there, continued talking, uh, talking in lunchroom, talking, you get the idea. Almost every time he's, he's just cannot stop from chatting with the other prisoners. And he keeps getting written up. And the bad thing is he keeps getting time. Time isn't added to your sentence. But what happens is, let's say you're sentenced for to two years in prison, you'll automatically get out a couple months early if you're a good prison, if you don't get written up for any conduct or rule violations. Every time you get written up for a violation, there's a possibility that they'll add some time back into your sentence to get more to, to your back to your original sentence. So you can Delos here for one of those things where he was talking in school. He got 30 days added back into his sentence. So, um, I mean, that's pretty significant. And then another time he was talking on the range, he got 30 days added. So that's, that's not good for him, but kind of feel for him. I mean, he just, I mean, I, you know, I can understand, you know, you get, you're stuck there and you want to kind of talk to your friends and the guards don't like that apparently, um, in 1930s at least. Um, for Delo Stoddard, we actually have a case file too. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that we have case a lot of these. We have, unfortunately, precious few case files for prisoners. I wish we had more. I, there were probably case files at every institution. I bet every one of these institutions we've, that I'm talking about today, the, the poorhouses, the asylums, no matter what they are, they probably had a case file, set of case files for each person that was there. Unfortunately, most of them haven't survived. I mean, they're bulky for one thing. So, I mean, if we took all the case files from every facility, every institution that there ever was in the state, we would fill that up, fill our building up with that alone. We wouldn't be able to collect anything else. So, you know, unless we can get them on microfilm, I, I'm guessing at sometimes we don't take case files or we haven't taken case files, or maybe we'll only take a sample of them. Unfortunately, that's the case with these 1930s Wisconsin State Prison sam uh, case files. We only took a one in 10 sample of them. So it just happens that, you know, we have this set of case files from the 1930s and it just so happens that we have Delo Stoddard's case file. We don't have the other nine, you know, out of every 10 or maybe the other 10 prisoners, or if there were nine other prisoners in his cell block, you know, 10 total, we only have his, we don't have the other ones or however it worked out randomly. But when we do, it's a gold mine because it, there's a lot more detailed information. A lot of times they'll interview the prisoner and have them tell their story in their words about what happened or what their background is or their family life or whatever. You get their fingerprints there. I, I don't know what use that is, but it's, it's kind of cool. I wish I had my, my, um, some of my ancestors' fingerprints. Um, you'll get uh, photos. So here's the mug shot for Delo Stoddard, set of mug shots. I've worked with people uh, who this is the only photo they have of someone is the mugshot. Now, yeah, it's not ideal to have that it's a mugshot, but it's a photo. You didn't have a photo before. Um, maybe you could, you know, use Photoshop to take that prisoner number out or something. I, they still look like mugshots, but I don't know. You could take the middle one here and put in a fake background like he's in a park or something, and then you could put it on your mantle. But I mean, I'm joking, but it's. It, it's it's great to have a photo I, and most people don't care that it's a mugshot because because um, especially people who are institutionalized a lot um, if they're from a poor family there might not be a lot of photos that have survived and, and truly I've had genealogists tell me that the only photo that they have is the one that we found in the you know prison record or the institution record or something uh, here's a, a a sheet this is wonderful this is a this is one of those sort of case histories, uh, it's in his words. It, I don't know if you can read it, but you got another copy of a photo of his photo there. But down at the bottom half says story of crime. So that's the place where they talk to the prisoner and take down their version um, of the story um, or of the crime. So at first it just says it's the, the, the person who's typing it up says bench trial and attorney pled guilty, 
partner, Robert Gilbertson, still at large, stole several cars in various towns in Wisconsin and abandoned them in various places. But then it breaks into, at some point, the actual, presumably, the words of him himself and um, telling his story of what happened uh, toward the end. Of, so what happened was they, they stole this car, but they had to abandon it. And then they just couldn't resist at later going back and trying to find it again. Um, and of course, predictably, the police were waiting there, like in hiding, waiting for somebody to come back and get the car. And so when they got back to the car, the police ambushed them and they jumped in the car and, and sped off. And then, he, and then he picks up the story here where he says, uh, let's see, well, the police squad car was hid between two houses near the Buick waiting for us to come back to it and gave us and gave chase when we went by. And after we crossed the bridge on First Street again, they opened fire. So this is a, there's a gunfire going on. They're shooting at him. And about the third shot punctured a front tire, which turned us around on the road. Gilbertson, that's his partner, jumped out and fled into the neighboring marsh. And I couldn't get away as I was driving. I don't know. I just I think that's fantastic. I mean, I, I don't have a, I don't know if I have a single case where one of my ancestors, um, I have something in writing in their words about something that happened to them. Again, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not cool that he stole a car, but I, I do think it's, it's. I just love this stuff because uh, you hear, you can almost hear him talking, and 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 that stuff is 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 so rare to find for the average person, you know, unless you have an ancestor that was very literate and wrote a lot of long diary entries and wrote a long letters. I can tell you that I don't really have too many of those ancestors in my family tree, so. I treasure any of these kinds of things I can find. Uh, here is a another very useful thing that's in his case file because it's his rap sheet or his, his previous his previous um, arrests. And each one of these is a potential has a potential for more records or or clues to more things to look for. Um, so you can continue to search. So it's a, just a it's a sheet for that has lots of other leads. I don't know if you can again read it, but talks about his arrest in Broadhead for stealing a car, his arrest in Janesville for, um, for um, speeding. Now, again, maybe at the initial arrest, maybe in Janesville or in the Rock County, maybe spent some time in the Rock County Jail, I don't know, before he was fined or before he was sentenced to the state reformatory. But that's what happened in 26, sentenced to the state reformatory. Um, it does not give his prisoner number at the state reformatory, I don't think. But it does give a date that he arrived at the reformatory, and that's a clue we can use to look for his prisoner. Oh, no, it does. I'm sorry, it says 5751. And that's crucial because I don't have a, an alphabetical index for the state reformatory. The reformatory kept that. They're still around. They're called the Green Bay Correctional Facility, and they still have a card index. And I understand that the warden there um, is a, likes history and likes looking these things up. I don't know if that's still true or he, he, the warden, the warden of the prison still likes it of the state reformatory. So if you contact the state reformatory, that's a good place to start. Um, if you start with me, I'll send you there first because they have this card index. They can look somebody up alphabetically and they'll find their prisoner number. They'll send you a copy of the card. But then by all means, come back to us because I have one set of records from the reformatory that has, usually has a photo and has a, has a um, basic overview of their time at the reformatory but I need that prisoner number. I don't have an index in there just by number. But anyway, this rap sheet here gives me that number. So I could use that. Uh, it says he was also at the Milwaukee House of Corrections. We don't have records here for the Milwaukee House of Corrections. I don't know if the Milwaukee County Historical Society has them, but that's where I would probably refer people to check next to see if the Milwaukee House of Corrections records are there. Maybe some of you out there know that and can share it in the chat. Uh, maybe you've tried this before uh, for that, but that was a lot of people were at the Milwaukee House of Corrections, and that dates back to at least the 1860s too. So that has a long history. I just know we don't have the records, unfortunately, for, for that institution. But again, any one of these gives you some more clues to follow. Here is the reformatory record, and I used that number 5751 to find his um, his record at the Wisconsin Reformatory that we have. Again, you can tell the characteristic look of microfilm including the, the horrible contrast, which makes the photo look like a shadow. Um, but I, can, I could clean that up a little bit. Um, I just use the high contrast so you could read it, possibly read what's on here. But I can get a better image than that, but not a great one, unfortunately, of the, of the mugshot. But it's an earlier mugshot. It's 1926, so it's almost 10 years earlier. Um, so he's a younger, it's a younger Dale Stoddard, and it's another mugshot on microfilm. 
this is um, the reformatory record is a summary of again of their stay there uh, handwritten at the top and then it also has a conduct record built into it like I showed you the separate conduct record that the state prison kept and I don't need to tell you that um, he was written up several times at the reformatory for again talking and laughing um, talking talking and laughing talking yeah so he's he just um, he just can't help himself. Oh yeah, here you go. I maybe you can read this better. This I, I forgot I had zoomed in here too. So on the top part, it's, it's still it's handwritten and a little small, maybe on your screen. But another record. Uh, it's kind of kind of thing we have for the reformatory. So prison records, um, they're one of the most heavily used things. That and the the Mendota uh, Mental Hospital, the State Asylum, are the two. I would say I have to, where I work with the most for genealogists are the state prison and the uh, state mental hospital at Mendota, and then less to a lesser extent, the reformatory, house, home for women, school for boys, school for girls, um, corrections stuff, but um, the state prison and state mental hospital. So I'm going to talk about the state mental hospital next as an example. Um, there were two state mental hospitals and as i i mentioned earlier just reiterate it's a it's a sort of statewide system there are county asylums and there are state asylums and people transfer between them sometimes it's all a government system even if they're sent to the state asylum the county is often still footing the bill so um, a lot of these the state institutions like the state mental hospital uh, one of the set of records we have for them are the county admission volumes because they wanted to keep track of which county somebody was from because they actually charged the county for it. So if a county didn't have its own asylum, they still had to pay for the care or at least part of the care at the Mendota Hospital. And if they were transferred from Brown County, for example, that doesn't mean Brown County is free of paying for it. They still had to pay for it. And you know, probably one reason for that is they just didn't want because they want all the counties to just automatically send everybody to the state. So they had all these county asylums, and then they had two big state asylums, the Northern Hospital for the Insane, they originally called it, which when, is now called the Winnebago Mental Health Institute, and the Mendota or the State Asylum, they didn't call it the Southern, but it's the original state asylum at Mendota, excuse me, Mendota, which is now called the Mendota Mental Health Institute, and that's right here north of Madison, north of Lake Mendota. Those were the two, and they and so there are two different state institutions somebody could be at. We have records here at the Historical Society for the Mendota Mental Health Institute or the state and state asylum at Mendota. We do not have patient records from the Winnebago Mental Health Institute or otherwise known as the North Northern Asylum. Now, just to confuse things even more, there was a Winnebago County Asylum too. That's one of those county asylums. That's separate, and we do have some records for the Winnebago County Asylum. Those are stored at our UW Oshkosh Area Research Center, but that's different than the state asylum. Sometimes it's hard to tell from a census record whether they're talking about the Winnebago County Asylum or the Winnebago Mental Health Institute or the Northern Hospital for the Insane, which is at the city or the town of Winnebago. So it's, it's confusing. Again, we can help you sort that out depending, you show us what you found and we can usually figure out whether it was the county or this, the state. Just because we don't have records though, you're, you don't have to stop there because I know for a fact that Winnebago Mental Health Institute, the current hospital there does have an art, their own archives and they do have some old patient records for the old Northern Hospital for the Insane or the, the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. They, they do have patient records and I know that people have successfully gotten access to some of those records. So again, if you contact me, I can send you, I would send you their website and redirect you to them because I know there's a chance you can get records if they were at that Northern Hospital. I'm gonna talk about Mendota because that's what we have records for here. And that's almost on a weekly basis. I, you know, I or one of my volunteers or student workers I have, I'm helping me look at those records for people. So here's a, an 1860 photo or circa 1860 photo of the State Hospital for the Insane at Mendota. Again, it's still there, still operational. Uh, and sometimes you can still contact them. I, they do have, they do still have patient records there. Although I think most of the really old ones, you know, anything that still have survived, they probably sent to us. Um, this is one of those mental health um, 
records uh, are, are restricted under state law. And I think I mentioned already, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure I mentioned that we deal with a lot of restricted records. I think I talked about the, how the adoption and orphanage records are heavily restricted. Well, mental health records are too. Um, as the state archives, we have the ability to provide access under certain conditions to records that are older than 75 years, at least for state institutions like the state mental hospital. So this ledger I'm showing you here, this admission um, ledger is from 1882. So it's within my rights uh, as archivist here to provide access. Even so, I've blacked out the last names of people on this list just because we are still cautious. I mean, <sighs> Yes, these records could, are technically open for access, um, but there's no need for me to put the last names in there. And you know, who knows? Maybe you'll see um, a name of uh, a neighbor's ancestor or something who doesn't want people to know or doesn't necessarily want to know themselves that their ancestor was at the uh, state asylum. If you contacted me as a genealogist or if you came here in person, I would allow you to look at this page. I would have you sign something saying that you won't make a photo of it or share the other names on there other than your deceased ancestor. If you contacted me by email, I would black out all the names except for the name of your ancestor. So I can, I can provide access. I just am being extra cautious. If people want to know about their ancestor who is now deceased, I will provide access, but I'm not just, you know, digitizing them all and sending them out there and letting everybody see all the names. Um, just to be cautious. Uh, we, wanna, we wanna show, you know, part of this as an aside, I wanna demonstrate to all those agencies out there, those local government rate agencies and state agencies that give transfer these records to us and sometimes don't maybe fully trust that we're gonna be careful about um, uh, providing access. I wanna show them that we're very responsible and that we are, take it very seriously. We wanna protect people's privacy. We want to protect people's identities and confidential records. But when the law allows us to provide access, we also want to provide access because that's our job here. We, I hate it when I can't provide access, I have to be honest. I mean, I hate it when I have to say, hey, this is an adoption record. I cannot do anything. You're going to have to get permission um, through the adoption record search program because I'm trained as an archivist, librarian and archivist. I want to provide access. So it kills me when I can't. But I also want to be responsible. And we, as an institution, we have to be responsible if we want to continue to be able to do this. Uh, so anyway, this is an admission page similar to the ones you've seen for the poorhouse, for the all these institutions, you know, uh, the county asylum, whatever, uh, the jail. They keep track of people coming in, keep track of people leaving. So for the Mendota, Mendota, this is one of the longest running series of records we have are these admission and discharge volumes. Again, I don't have a great index for this for Mendota. I have an, a set of address books that are in chronological chunks. They're difficult to use as an index, but I can do it. Um, I prefer it if we kind of know roughly when somebody arrived again. So maybe you find them in the census. Um, this is how it sometimes works. I found them in the 1880 census at Mendota. I don't know when they arrived, but I do know that that person got married two years before that, um, or I found a record for them and I know they weren't in the hospital two years before that. So it had to be in that two year window. That's great, that narrows things down. It helps me a lot to find people in these Mendota records. Um, maybe you'll find again a newspaper that gives the date. If you know something about the circumstances that narrows the date, that's great information because most of these records from Mendota, like a lot of other institutions are in date order again. So this is the admission uh, page for April of 1882, and it gives you the hospital number on the left. So that's, again, they always assign a number to people, uh, which is often the key to other records. Uh, gives you the date of the, the day of the month. So the 3rd, the 7th, the 8th of April, the 10th, when somebody arrived, their name, their age, their gender, the town they're from, their physical condition, which is not very helpful, but it does say like fair, good, poor. Um, their birthplace, which is just usually, well, I see here, England, Pennsylvania, you know, so very general, Germany, their occupation. I see a lot of farmers again. I see a Mason, I see a laborer. And then the address of a relative that you can contact, maybe it's the person who, who dropped them off or they're a guardian or friends that in case of an emergency, they're the person that you're supposed to contact. And again, I blacked out the names there. Um, some basic notations about their mental condition. And then the cause of insanity is the last thing listed there. 
And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, this is all we have about their diagnosis. There, there are a further set of admission records, and I'll show you, it's a form, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second, but even those aren't terribly detailed. And to be truthful, especially in the 19th century and early 20th century, they just did not have a good handle on mental illness. What they describe, they, what they describe as mental illness, it's very generic. They, there's, it's hard to tell what they're really suffering from. Uh, and there's a lot of things we wouldn't classify as mental illness today um, th that brought people to these places. Let me, let me zoom in a little bit on the cause of insanity remarks there. So all you have for the first person there is loss. So this probably means, I think that's what that means, is just loss. Like maybe they lost someone who, who died, you know, somebody died in the family, bereavement more or less. Or the second one is disappointment. So just disappointment. And I do see bereavement as the next one. So maybe loss is an abbreviation for something. I, I don't know. Uh, heredity. Heredity and injury. I see religious excitement there. Um, a railroad injury. I think that's what that is. RR injury. So maybe it was a railroad worker that got injured, maybe struck on the head, sunstroke, uh, no cause stated. Um, there's a whole variety of things. I guess it's somewhat helpful. Um, it's just not as detailed. It's not as clinical. There aren't, you know, official psychiatric diagnoses are, are not laid out than the way they are now. They're not spelled out. There's not a, a an accepted um, scientific nomenclature, I guess I would say. So it's, it's, it's kind of vague in a lot of cases. Um, and this person for certain, for certain time periods, this is 1880s. So 1860s to about 1908, we have a four, set of four page application forms or their admission forms that are just pre-printed that are filled out. Here's an example of a woman um, admitted, a 23-year-old woman admitted in September of 1862. Again, usually single word answers. Um, birthplace is New York. She's single, she's 23. She's a domestic, so she's a servant um, of some kind. Um, she's admitted uh, September of, of 1862, and it says she's incoherent, frequent attacks for seven years. The disease is not increasing or decreasing. It's, in, it's stationary. Um, are there rational intervals? It says no. Is she disposed to injure, injure others? No, but she is disposed to destroy clothing or other property. It says yes. Um, are there any relatives who have suffered from, uh, quote, insanity? Um, yes, a, um, an uncle. Uh, the next page includes um, were they ever addicted that, uh, or intemperate to intoxicating drink or opium or tobacco uh, or improper, whatever that is, habits. It, there's no answer there, so it's probably a no or unknown. Uh, then the only other thing is it says, has, there, has any, any restraint or confinement been resorted to? If so, what, so, so what kind and how long? And I think it says sometimes kept in a part of the room in which she was retained by perpendicular bars. So I guess she was locked in a cage area or something like that uh, is what it sounds like. So that's the admission form. And, and usually for this time period, that's it. That's all we get, all we have. Maybe there'll be a discharge entry too for when they were discharged. In this case, there were a couple of letters tucked in there too in that file. Uh, I'll show you an example of this one page. And it was letters from a relative um, I guess giving some more information about her and you know her condition. I mean, trying to be helpful. I think um, like when she first started showing symptoms, and it also says when she is well, she is a smart and intelligent girl. Um, her twin sister has always been healthy. So this is a case where there was a twin, a twin sister who was not institutionalized. Um, poignant and 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 pretty interesting. Um, and again just wonderful extra information about the per experiences of this person and the circumstances. And um, if you really wanted to take a deep dive, you could start digging into what standard treatments were in 1860 and what conditions might have been like there. You're not going to get a sense of that, unfortunately, from these records, except for the restraint part, obviously, you saw that. Um, but uh, you could get a sense by, by digging a little further into how these places worked in 1860. Okay, um, one more institution I want to jump into here quickly. Let me see how I'm doing for time. I'm going really long. I apologize for that. Um, this 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 talk is supposed to be 
this thing is supposed to be about an hour long, but I guess even when I'm talking to my computer screen, I can't stop talking, uh, unfortunately. So I apologize for that. Um, and I excuse you if you've had to step away, um, I don't know, to fan yourself, get a drink of water, you know, uh, if you felt faint. Um, anyway, I promise you there's just one more institution I'm going to go over here and then we'll have time for questions. I want to talk about an example of orphanages. Um, we have two state run records from two state run or orphanages. One of them is the Civil War so Soldiers Orphans Home, which was set up right after the Civil War for children whose fathers were killed during the war. Um, so they may not have been completely orphaned, but they may be partially orphaned or maybe they lost both parents. And the records actually run from 1865 all the way to the 1890s because some of these children, I guess, continued to receive assistance long after uh, the war, uh, even into um, adulthood. I guess. Um, so the sort, but unfortunately, we don't have a ton of material here. We have the names of some of the so, uh, kids who were in this uh, part of the soldiers' orphans' home. Either they spent time there, or they were aided by the soldiers' orphans' home with money or some other other thing. Uh, so we do have a sort of a list of names. And that's about it. The other one is the Wisconsin Child Center, which was established in 1886. It's existed under many different names. Uh, let's see here. We have, it's been called the State Public School, the State Home for Dependent Children. And I think later in its life, it was called the Wisconsin Child Center. Doesn't exist anymore. Uh, started in 1870, 1886, and I think it went to the 1970s. Our records anyway stop about 1976. So I, um, I, I, and I, I know it doesn't exist. I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, the Monroe County Historical Society um, has some material that they've compiled actually, they've, they've taken census records and tried to compile a list or database of children they know at least were there during the census years. And they have some photos and they've done some oral histories with people who were at the school. So that, they have some wonderful resources to understand in some ways who was there, but also what it was like there. So I recommend, um, I don't think I put that on my handout unfortunately, but um, if you think you might have an ancestor that was a child that was at the, uh, the state orphanage or the state school for dependent children, check out Monroe County Historical Society because they've created some wonderful resources. Because we're the state archives for the state of Wisconsin, we have some official state government records from that institution, including the, the same old sort of admission record or log book. It's, it's basically one page for each kid that was filled out as they arrived. And it also gives some sort of overall history of their time there. Um, again, in date order, unfortunately, I don't have an index to those, so I need to know a time window to look in. But um, that's the basic record, and it only goes up to 1913. That's another downside for those records. I also have a set of we also have a set of case files here, which are much more detailed, but they're they're only for a percentage of the kids who were there. I don't know why we. we I would say maybe we have 30 percent of the kids who were there between 1886 and, and 1976, we'd have a case file, maybe even less than 30%, but it seems like that's about the success rate I have, maybe one in four I find there in, in my list of case files. I think part of it has to do with if the child was adopted officially, then the state kept those records. And that's the adoption record search program again that keeps those and there's a website for that and you can apply to have access but I don't even have a list of names for that because those are supposed to be confidential. So what I usually do is if somebody sends me a name and I can't not find a case file here or a record of a case file for them, I say you could try the adoption record search program because maybe I don't have a case file because they were adopted. Um, that's that's a, one explanation. So here's a photo again of, uh, uh, we have millions of photos, by the way, in our collections here. Um, a lot of them are privately donated or they're donated by a photographer. Um, this comes from our state records because state agencies took pictures of their own buildings and there are other photos of the state school and um, some of them show the interiors. I, I should have mentioned that when I showed the prison photos too and uh, the Dane County Hospital and home photos. We are likely to have photos of individual inmates or patients unless it's part of a case file. Uh, sometimes they'll show children from a distance like playing in a you know, room or something, but it's, they're not identified by name. 
So uh, for the state school, um, again, you could find that someone was at Sparta um, by looking at the census record, by searching a census record. Like, as I said, the Monroe County Historical Society has systematically gone through the census and made lists of children who are appear at the, the state school during those census years. So even though we consider those records to be restricted in some way and confidential, they didn't they still put them in the census and those census records are still open or they were open, they open, you know, on a rolling basis after 75 years or whatever the date is. So you can find them in 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940. You can find the kids who are at the state school. Of course, you're missing all the kids who were there in between those years. So in that 10 year period between 1930 and 40, there are lots of kids who come and go that don't appear there. So you're not going to find them. Um, that's the trick with that. But that's this is a way that a lot of people come to me is because they find it. Or in this case, it's actually more common that there's a family story or family history or lore that says grandma or great grandma was, tell, you know, always told me she was um, in an orphanage or at Sparta for several years before she was taken in by a family or whatever. So sometimes we, we do have stories like that this time. People aren't as reluctant to talk about that as they are the prison or the, the criminal records. So I'm, I have this one, I'm showing you this one. And again, I blacked out the names, even though you can readily look this up in the census and go try to find them, but I'm just being super extra cautious. And for our purposes here, you don't really need to know the name. I, you, I'm just showing you an example here. So the person I'm interested in is Ruth. She's the fourth person listed here on this little clip from the 1920 census. She was at Sparta, listed as an inmate. Um, she's also two months old. It says two over 12. So she's a two month old infant. And at the time the census was taken, she uh, was at Sparta. All right, well, in this case, I looked at our case files and we do have a case file for Ruth. And here is the cover page for the case file. Sometimes these case files are literally, if a child was admitted like Ruth in, at one year old or, or, or two months old, and they were there, or they were in Sparta custody until they were released, released in uh, at when they came of age. Some children were were under in the custody of of the state school from the time they were a baby until they came of age and and were released as an adult. That's a lot of years. And some of those case files are six hundred, even a thousand pages. They're really thick, you know, thick case file of documents, uh, depending on how complicated their stay was and you know how many you know, maybe medical issues they had, how many families they were placed with and all that kind of thing. So, but again, they are, they are so rich with documentation. I mean, they, they'll have caseworker reports they'll, who will visit the family home and visit the other siblings or talk to the family, and interview them. The one thing you do have to keep in mind with these case files though, is that the caseworkers can be pretty judgmental and you're only seeing it from the view of the caseworker. They might be like a middle-class caseworker and they might look on down on this family as being poor or you know, judge the, the father as useless or a wastrel or a drunk or you know, judge, they'll use a lot of judgmental language like that. And you have to take it with a grain of salt and, and remember uh, that this is not from the point of view of the family itself or the children themselves. So keep, keep, always keep that in mind with all of these records that I have here, almost all of them are, have that bias. They're from the point of view of the state or the government workers. And that's not always the most fair to the person who's in, in these places. So this cover sheet for Ruth here, who was admitted as a two month old, um, all it tells you is that the mother's name is Mary, and it does give a surname for the mother, which I've blacked out here. But the mother's name is Mary. Again, she's a servant or a domestic and gives you a clue maybe as to how she became an unwed mother because the father, the alleged father, there's a form, space on the form for the alleged father, and it says unknown. I don't know if, I can't remember in this case, she might've just left the child there and they didn't get a chance to talk to her. So maybe that's why it's unknown. But in some cases, the mother's unwilling to say who the father is. Uh, was the father her employer as a domestic? It's not uncommon. Could have been some, some other situation, I don't know. So she left Ruth there at, um, it does say that Ruth was born in La Crosse County and has a birth date. But other than that, uh, and that the mother's name is Mary, not much else. I guess it also says Holman, 
uh, the address home in, in, in La Crosse County so that gets a little closer to a place. Um, I only show you a couple of examples of things in that file. Um, in, the, in the case of Ruth, there, there are many, many sad stories in these case files. After having seen a lot of them, I can tell you, again, I, told, I showed you how the poor house, you know, if you got frostbite and couldn't walk and you couldn't work anymore, or you got broken ribs, or your husband was crazy or left you or whatever in the lurch and you didn't have a way to support yourself, you could end up in a poor house. Well, these children ended up here, a lot of agonizing circumstances. Um, I can tell you that this case with Ruth is happy relatively, other than the fact that her mother had to give her up at two months. It turned out pretty well, but a lot of cases didn't. Um, what happens with most of these kids who are at the uh, state school is that at some point they are indentured. They called it indenture in the, in the old days. Um, now we, you know, it's similar to foster care or having foster parents, but indenture, as indenture implies, there was a work component to it. So almost like out of a Dickens novel or something, these children, uh, a farmer could write to the state school and they did often, you'll see in these case files, a farmer, a local farmer will write to the state school and say, I would like a um, young boy to do, help with farm work, or I would like a young girl to help with far, farm with housework. And they would write to the state school and the state school would maybe visit there. And they would check out the place or talk to the parents maybe, and or the, 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 the family, and they would, place a child with that family and they were expected to work and there'll be letters in the file that will say, you know, uh, this kid's not working out. They're not working hard enough or they're, they're talking back to me. They're not listening to me, whatever. I don't like them. I, I don't, whatever it is they would write. Um, and then they would send the kid back and then maybe the school would send them a different kid. But then there are some of these case files where a child is placed over and over from one place to another like that, sort of like kids bounce through foster care now. But to me, this is a little worse because it, there's this work component. And then if you stayed there until you became an adult, you got a check from the state to compensate you for your whole childhood of work or however much work you did. And usually I think that was about $50 or something like that. You got some sort of amount, a check to get a start with, I guess. Um, so again, a lot of these are sad stories. This one uh, turned out okay. And the other thing that happens is that when kids arrive at the state school here, just like a lot of orphanages, I suspect, when they're babies, they have a much better chance of being adopted when they're little. But when they arrive there when they're 10 or 12 or 13, it's a lot tougher because they're older, because they have a harder time adjusting to the family or the, heart, the family has a harder time sort of accepting them into their own family. Those are the kids that often bounce from one family to the other and are never formally adopted. Ruth, because she was two years old, she was only at the school itself for about six months. Um, happened to be 1920 though. So she got picked up in the census, even though she was at Sparta for two, six months, about six months only, um, she, uh, six or eight, six to eight months, she got picked up in the census because it happened to be 1920. After that, she was placed with a family and she's going to appear in the, in the census as being part of that family, maybe as a um, adopted child or stepchild or foster child that might, they might list them that way. It depends on what the family tells the census taker, but they won't be listed with the Sparta, with the building. So at any given time, Sparta had a lot of children who were not actually in the building. They were placed out with families. So Ruth, because she's two months old, there's someone who came to visit the school and, and obviously visited with some children. And then a little while later, um, I wrote back that this, this woman was in Partyville and wrote back to the Sparta, Mrs. Ada Groove, who worked at Sparta and said, Mrs. Groove, I have decided to take the little baby girl eight months hold with the black eyes. You could bring her anytime after next week. So it sounds to me like this woman from Partyville and maybe her husband came to the school, visited with a bunch of children, and then went home and talked about it and then decided they wanted to take in this um, infant girl named Ruth. So they did. Um, and it turns out they kept Ruth um, until she was an adult. And they more or less, I can tell you, accepted her as one of the family and really fought a lot of her. And it sounds like she had a pretty good childhood with this family. They never formally adopted her, however. So she stayed a ward of the state that entire time, which is one reason I have the file here and I can show you because she was never formally adopted. I think at some point in the file, they talk about it, but they never go through with it. 
So for whatever reason, they accept she all for all intents and purposes was a member of the family, accepted completely as a daughter, but was never formally adopted. So uh, another example of the kind of thing you'll find in these files are these sort of case logs, like brief notes from over the years, from time to time when they check in on her, the people at the state school check on, in on her, either they'll call the family or visit the family. Um, so I, again, I blacked out some of the names here, but um, you see a, a visit uh, where the snowstorm was so bad. That was the November 30th, 1928. They couldn't actually visit to bring Ruth. So they were supposed to meet um, a caseworker just to uh, check in on her, but they couldn't do it because there was a bad snowstorm. So they postponed it. Um, a later th time, they, um, I guess they visited maybe it looks like uh, in 1932, uh, the family started calling her Jean Ruth because they like Jean better. And she's in eighth grade at that point. Um, they plan to send her to high school because she's an excellent scholar and enjoys all her schoolwork. A uh, visitor was shown a snapshot. Um, the last line, it says Fs, meaning foster parents or FPs, I guess, are very fond of her. So that's good. Um, and you'll see this running through her entire childhood because they check in on her from time to time. You know, if there's like some sort of medical expense or medical problem or whatever, that'll usually be documented in here because I think the state reimbursed them for some expenses, uh, the families. Uh, the file does include a photo, and because I doubt that anybody will be able to recognize her from just a photo here, here's a photo of Ruth, again, because it's adorable. Um, a photo, this is obviously after she's already with her, her foster family, because she's um, much older than just an infant. And then finally, another nice little note toward the end of the file, uh, as she's becoming an adult, uh, it's a note from the foster mother saying, Jean is planning on attending the UW in September. And, um, but then it also says her lenses need changing. I think it has to do with her glasses. And again, because the state school reimburses them for some expenses, I think that's what she, why she's writing to the state school saying, um, you know, she needs some new lenses for her glasses because uh, she's going to be attending UW. But that's, a, that's a, again, a much happier, more positive story than I'm used to seeing uh, in these files. So I want to, don't want to, there's enough depressing stuff in these files. I don't want to bring people down with these um, now one and a half hour long presentations. Uh, um, I'm going to remind you too, though, that Katie talked at the beginning for a little bit. So, um, uh, you know, it's not all my fault, but mostly my fault. Um, let me just, that's that's basically the all I have for you. I was going to mention the school for uh, deaf and school for blind, the blind and the Northern Colony. Another thing we have some records for state, uh, they had a Southern colony and a central colony too. Those are mainly for the, what we call developmentally disabled. We have some sketchy records for all of those that cover some of the people who are at those schools, some of the mostly children. So just putting those in your ear, but you know, if you, if you run across anybody who was institutionalized, even if it's not at Wisconsin and you just want some advice because I've dealt with this for so long, I, I know how these kinds of things work and, and where the paper trails usually are. So I'm happy to throw whatever advice I can um, at you. And uh, with that, I will bring you up to the, the, the end of ending slide here. And it has that all important email. Keep throwing those emails at me. I'm sure there's probably 20 of them have arrived during this long hour and a half that I've been on here, but that's okay. Cause I, I it keeps me, um, it's really, I love my job because you guys sort of, the pe people who come in or write me emails determine what I'm looking at or what I'm, what little rabbit holes I'm going down or where I'm, where, what records I'm looking at. And it's never the same. There's always something new every day. So I actually enjoy, enjoy getting those emails. So don't feel, don't feel timid, but also be aware that if you don't hear from me immediately, it's because there's a hundred of them <laughs> waiting for me and I'm just constantly working at it. So, um, but I, but I, I like them though. So, so send them on. So Katie, I'll turn it over to you to you can moderate any questions or throw any questions if anybody has survived this long. Oh, plenty of people are, you know, typing in the chat and saying what an excellent presentation and how fantastic mm. this has been. And I oh, even good. made I'm notes glad. for myself on things that I need to follow up with you on. So I'm excited to have more things to research. <laughs> okay. We do have some questions. Sure. Um, so first we were wondering, um, do you have records for the Wisconsin Home for the Feeble Minded, which was located in Lafayette Township in Chippewa County? Yes, and um, 
that is the what I called also called it was also called the Northern Colony at some point, and that that was the one I was referring to. Um, uh, we do have records for that one. There was also a similar institution for the southern part of the state at some point called the Southern Colony and the Central Colony. We don't have records for those, but we do have some records for that um, that hospital in Chippewa Falls. As I recall, it is mostly that sort of basic admission information I was showing you, the kind of admission register. Um, although there are some other kinds of things in there, like um, some children were placed in um, occupations and there's like occupational placement records for some years. There's also unfortunately some um, lists and records related to sterilization because that was a thing they did up until the 1960s, believe it or not, in Wisconsin, they, they uh, forcibly sterilized some uh, people who were at, those in, at that institution and, and others like it in Wisconsin starting in, in the 19 teens. And then there's also, I forgot one type of record I forgot to mention, which is fairly common at these institutions, if people died there, and then um, especially if they died there and their family couldn't afford to have their remains sent back home, a lot of those places have graveyards. And you'll see that it's been in the news a lot lately because some other states are finding that there are even unmarked graves, which is a horrible thing at some of these places of orphanages or you know the boys and girls schools and where children were and they died. Um, but oh, the ones that I know of, we like the state prison, Mendota, and I think this Northern Hospital or Northern Colony or uh, the one in Chippewa Falls, I think we have some records of people who died there too. Um, maybe a death record, maybe a burial record confirming that they're buried on site there. So yeah. that's one that if you have people, if you're interested in that one, send that email. Yeah, I definitely, I have experience um, with one of the Oregon uh, mental health um, institutions with one of my ancestors. I found out he had passed away there and actually his ashes were unclaimed. So our family got to claim his ashes and wow. we're looking forward to reuniting them with the rest of the family in Chiocton. So, you know, that reminds me, if I can just defer I, again, don't just stop me. Just, you know, give me this if I, if you want me to stop talking here, but that reminds me of, I just discovered this too. This is an example of how, I, as long as I've been here, I, I find out things all the time, but I, there was somebody I was working with just in the last couple of months whose ancestor was at Mendota here on North of Madison. They died at Mendota and they could not figure out though, they figured out from calling Mendota that they were not in the cemetery there. They were not back at the any home cemetery they could find. They could not find their remains. But when I looked at the Mendota record for the person, it said that their body was given to the University of Wisconsin. And this was like, you know, 19 teens or something like that. I contacted the UW um, archives and they still have a body donation program there. And they have records going all the way back to before 1900 because bodies were given to the state. If they were unclaimed by the family, they might be sent to the UW University so students could work on these, you know, for like anatomy or medical education or whatever then they have a record that shows that they would after they were the uw was done with this because this this person died and they were poor the body couldn't nobody claimed them they donated the institution donated the body to uw uw did whatever they did with it and then they cremated the body and then it turns out that for a long time they just dumped the ashes next to science hall here which is right behind our building here wow. so i had to tell the person that their ancestors ashes are probably you know, right behind my building here at Science Hall. But anyway, just shows you how it's also typical. It's not surprising, is it, that that's the way that that kind of worked, you know? Anyway, go ahead. Next question. Sure. Um, a couple of people were actually wondering about Rock County. They said they didn't see any listings on the handout. So they were wondering if there was a reason for that or if you don't have anything for Rock County. Um, without going back to my, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you know, all of, all of our records are described in our online catalog. I, I probably would have listed it if it was there. I could have missed it. It sounds like, I think we have something, but it might not be, might not have patient records. Sometimes I can't tell you why I told you how like, like idiosyncratic record keeping can be. Some counties were better than others too. I mean, well, for one thing, some counties actually hung on to their records better. So you might not give up if you think that somebody was at a Rock County. I know there was a Rock County Asylum. I've run across that before in the newspapers. And so if you think somebody was there, contact the current Rock County Department of Health or whatever it is. If they kept records, that's probably where, and we don't have them, that's probably where they would have ended up. 
The other thing is, I don't know if I mentioned this before too, but sometimes those records ended up at local or at county historical societies. They're not supposed to because by law, county records, government records are supposed to come to us. If they're not at the agency, we're the only other legal repository technically. But like I said, before the 1940s, there was no law in the books you know, about government records. And even after that, people out in the counties, we're not in touch with them all the time. You know, sometimes there's some counties we don't talk to very often or hardly at all. And the people who work there don't know what the rules are or how things are supposed to work. And they want to make space. They want to get rid of records. So sometimes they end up at maybe the Rock County Historical Society, even though technically they're not supposed to have county records. I know for a fact that some county historical societies, uh, I can name it because I want you to find them. Like, like I think there are some school for girls records. Or there's some sort of county institutional records, Waukesha at Waukesha County Historical Society, as far as I know. And there might be other counties. So that's the thing to try. If I say I don't have, if we don't have them here. If we say we don't have them, try the county. If they say, oh, we haven't had that stuff for forever. I don't have no idea what you're talking about. Try a county historical society like Rock County, both of those places might steer you back this way, but you can say, well, I've already talked to them. You know, I mean, that might mean they're, they're, they're gone. And there are some counties where it doesn't have to be a fire. Sometimes there are courthouses, were courthouse fires, but sometimes counties just were not as rigorous in some situations. Maybe somebody, um, ent- you know, became clerk of courts or became like you know, ran the courthouse in 1945 or 50 or something, and they did a major renovation and they just decided without contacting anybody, not realizing, they just decided to get rid of a whole bunch of stuff. You know, uh, it just, I can't say why. I don't really know why, but I, you know, it's not hopeless. Yeah, I know two other people were wondering um, about uh, Richland County and Outagamie County. Is that kind of the same thing as, you know, same, check with same you to exact, see if you have it and if not. Same exact thing. Go ahead and send me an email. If it's not on my list, I'll, I'll do another check. Um, things change too. We're still acquiring things and, and surprisingly things turn up. I mean, somebody just gave us some records from New Diggings, Wisconsin from the 1840s. They're town records, they're county records. And, and actually this is a case where the county back in the Wild West days or whatever, sometime they threw them away, but somebody found them in the trash and kept them and then contacted us 40, 50 years later and said, hey, I found these things I, one day, a long time ago, they were throwing them out at the courthouse. And they weren't supposed to do that at the courthouse. They were supposed to offer them to us. Um, the person technically wasn't supposed to take them from the dumpster, but you know, thankfully they did because then they turned around and donated. So I'm just saying things come out of the woodwork all the time. I don't know everything we're acquiring at all times. So it's good for me to search again anyway. I made that list you saw a long time ago. So um, maybe we've gotten something since. I know Winnebago, there's some, I'm hoping that someday we get those Northern Hospital for the Insane, the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. Eventually, as the state archives, I'm hoping we get those, but at least they're still providing access there. And again, it's another case, you know, if we don't have them, try the county, try a local county historical society. I would also mention, I mentioned the, the ARC networks. I don't know how much familiar you are with the ARC archivists, but up, up where you guys are in Appleton, Green Bay or in Oshkosh area, you have a couple of veteran, very, very good archivists there. Deb Anderson at UW Green Bay, been there 30 years. I don't know how much longer she's going to be there. So take advantage of it. If, you know, I know uh, Green Bay Public Library, um, Mary Jane Herbert, uh, Herbert is there. She's She's got a lot of experience. Um, Oshkosh Public Library, I understand, has a great genealogy program. And the Oshkosh, the archivist at the ARC there, Josh, Josh Ranger, Joshua Ranger, long experience. He knows that area. He knows the county historical societies. Uh, Deb up at UW Green Bay knows the local historical societies, knows the county governments there. She's contacted them, I'm sure, over and over and over again. They're great resources, far better than me for those local areas because. I, I'm not out there. I'm not, I'm not up there. I, I'm not in contact with those people very often. So uh, if I forget when you contact me to, to refer you to the Area Research Center, um, uh, you know, that's, that's another thing to do, to yeah. use those resources, especially Green Bay. I, all the, the whole network has filled with lots of experienced, great people. But where you guys up there in Northeastern Wisconsin in particular, you have a couple of people that have been there a long time and are, are great resources. 
Yes, they are legends in them themselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I just want to encourage people to also reach out to your local library. I mean, we can connect you to resources as well. So all the resources that Lee just mentioned, I, I know all of them and I would refer yeah, you there Yeah, I'm sorry as well, that so. I just assumed because you're <laughs> yeah. we're at the Appleton Public Library, you all do that. So yes, Appleton yeah. too, of course. Public libraries. Yeah. You know, city, uh, just so many great sources. Absolutely. Um, someone's wondering, how does a person get sent to a county or state-run asylum? Is that always through court records or like, how would you find out that they got sent there? Yeah. Um, often it's by court records. In modern times, it is almost always, I think. I don't, I, here's the thing. There are some cases where you could walk in that are sort of voluntary. Say like a friend, like a family member brings you there and you are willing and you want to, you're okay with it or you're not fighting it, okay? Um, or there's nobody fighting it. I think, I, I'm not a legal expert, but, but just from observing the records, it seems to me that for a long period uh, of time in our history and a lot of the period that these records cover, if you were walked in or walked up, and you could have like a private doctor, you know, you might need a doctor's note or an exam, or they would just examine you there. I'm, I'm sure they, they did that as well. Um, there doesn't, I didn't think, I don't think there necessarily had to be a court record. I think you could just, if you were voluntarily being admitted, it's just like going to a hospital. The question is sometimes though, if, if the institution doesn't, isn't sure that you need to be, or they don't want to pay for it, they might require you to get a doctor's certification or send you back to get a court order or something because I, you know, I don't think maybe they're doubting it or they, because pay money is always an issue, but I do feel like you could be voluntarily admitted without having a court record. But there are also other times when people were involuntarily admitted, or if you're a child and one of the parents doesn't want to, or, you know, a child does need the, at least the parent's permission. And so there might have to be a guardianship proceeding or some sort of court proceeding in those cases when somebody is can't isn't competent for themselves to 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 so that's the other thing they call it a competency hearing those are part of guardianship records so even if you voluntarily come there but they judge you that you're not in a mental state to make a, a, a an informed decision then they might require that a judge or somebody commit you because you're not competent to make that decision for yourself so there are cases where there will be a court record and i but i don't think it's always so how do you know? I mean, like I said, you find it in the census. Uh, for a lot of early days, they didn't hesitate to put it in the newspaper. So if you're, you know, you can do newspaper searches, but a lot of newspapers are not digital. I, I assure you, if you're if you're a veteran de genealogist, you know that, you know, newspaper archive, newspapers.com, there's a lot of new Wisconsin newspapers in those, but there's a ton that are not, you know, you, Green Bay, Milwaukee, but also lots of other towns. So if you're searching newspapers.com and you don't find your person there, but you know they were in this little small town, I mean, if you I think it's worth any of us, any of you that have small town ancestors that had their own local paper, man, if you can spend the time to go to the Appleton Public Library and find a Wittenberg, or I don't know, I'm guessing here, guessing on what's in your area there, but let's say you have like a, the local paper, especially the smaller town papers, we have them in our library here for all the ones we know of for Wisconsin, but look at a small town newspaper in the 1920s, 30s. I've done that and they mention every little thing, you know. You can find out when your relative had a visitor from Milwaukee, you know. You can find out when their cow got loose or you can find out, but certainly if you were sent to the asylum, they're going to mention, they didn't hesitate to mention that in the newspaper and not all of those are digital. So sometimes it's worth like just trolling through those newspapers and you find, discover all kinds of things like that. Court records are typically are indexed, um, and I could spend a whole session on court records, but, you know, <laughs> another hour. But let me tell you that just in general, a lot of court records are still at the courts. So it's the clerk of courts for the various counties. We do have a lot of them, too, um, but there's a mix. Some of them are there. Some are at the different courts. We have, And there's both criminal cases and civil cases. Civil cases include things like divorces, probate, guardianship, just suing somebody privately. And I guess the thing to do is you can contact me first. Why not? Right. And just throw them in the pile there. Contact me and I'll check first whether we have them. 
whether maybe they're stored at our area research center at Green Bay or some other area research center. If we don't have them, then I'll refer you to say, check with the clerk of courts in that county and see what they have, how far back they go. We'll have things like indexes that'll be like, if, if again, if you guys have done this kind of local government records research, you might have looked through a microfilm reel of an old handwritten index or something, or maybe looked in a big dusty volume that's an index or a card index. A lot of our indexes are not digital. They're still, they're still in the paper form. I think both Deb at UW-Green Bay and Josh at, at UW-Oshkosh have put some court indexes online and they're on their websites. And you can find those on their websites. That's really helpful because some of those indexes will point you to maybe the, the, the other difficulty, as I said, with, with guardianship and commitment is they're still considered confidential. So you might have a little bit of trouble with the clerk of courts, you know, um, but if it's old enough, maybe they'll provide access because they're still considered, you know, their mental health records when somebody's committed involuntarily um, or if it's a guardianship but there are ways around it. I, that's the long answer. The short answer is there's no easy one place to look. It's just, if you're willing, you, you know, your chances are you'll either run across it or if you wanna do that deep troll into a local newspaper on microfilm or, or contact clerks of courts or search court indexes just on the chance that they're there. But usually people aren't willing to do that unless they have some idea that there was something there. Yeah, you don't want to have somebody search 40 or 50 years of yeah. indexed records. That's, That's not exactly. Fun. <laughs> yeah, we can't do it either. I mean, you could do it if you want to come here, but I can tell you it could be days of research and then you don't yeah. find anything. But if you're casting a wide net too and you're, you don't care if it's like anybody in the extended family, you have a ton of surnames. Like I said, if you look through the Dane County jail records and you had a whole extended family in Dane County for many decades, I think it's almost guaranteed you're going to find some surnames in there. That are, that are and Madison's a cool place to hang out. So why not yeah. camp out for yeah, a week? Come on in. <laughs> um, our next question is wondering, um, you know, they're saying some hospitals keep their records from way back. Is there any trick to getting records from hospitals for genealogical research? No trick. Um, uh, those are tough. We don't take them. I can tell you the historical society as a rule does not take hospital records. I mean, we have some medical records that are mixed in with case files, like um, the prison, state prison case files, the, the dependent, the home for dependent children. They're just mixed in. So we took the case files, even though they have medical records mixed in them, and we have to sometimes redact those, or sometimes, sometimes we can provide access if they're old enough. But we've generally avoided taking just plain hospital treatment records because of all the issues with privacy and they're voluminous. They're just like, again, they'd fill our entire building many times over. Uh, so most hospital records, unfortunately, you just, they, ha, ha, different ho hospitals are different in the way they handle them. And they're also in, in the current days that you can understand, like since the eighties and nineties, especially they, and since the privacy act of 1974 and since HIPAA, they are very, very careful about patient information. They wouldn't even give them to us if we wanted them, I don't think. And, and um, they are also going to be very tough about probably releasing information. And I do think that after a certain time period, they are prone to destroying old patient records just because they don't want to have any liability. They don't want, you know, and they... They take up space and whatever else, and they're not, you know, unfortunately, like a lot of uh, a lot of institutions, whether it's a, a government office or a um, hospital, they don't think of genealogists, which I wish they would. But they don't, you know. You can try though. So, for, let me give you an example locally here, because I get a lot of questions from people that say, "I had a grandmother that was sent to Madison General Hospital in 1925, you know, and had an operation there." Well, I know now from trial and error and experience that Madison General is now called Meritor Hospital and it's still here. So Meritor is still here and it used to be Madison General and it has roots that go all the way back to 1900 or the 19 teens or 20s. So that's your best bet. There's a chance, there's a chance that Madison General or Madison Meritor still has old Mer Madison General patient records. I kind of doubt it, but why not try, right? You can try and all they can say is no. And if they don't have it, then you're pretty much out of luck unless, unless a family member, a descendant 
has some medical records that were passed down. Because some people get copies of their own files and they get passed down. And we find them in family papers that are donated to us occasionally that somebody had some major medical condition and they had a case file that they got a hold of or a wife got a hold of for a husband or whatever. And they end up in the family papers. But, you know, so maybe just because you don't have it, maybe it found its way down the tree to somebody else. But that's a tough one, unfortunately. I, 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 my gut feeling is that they're almost all gone from if they're old enough, because because they don't these hospitals don't want to keep keep them because of liability. Yeah, or it would be very hard to access them, like you said, because of yeah. privacy stuff. Yeah. So, um, someone's wondering about the Wapan prison files. Um, I know you had said you have yeah. only some case files, so they're wondering if the prison would still have all of the other case files that you don't have. Unfortunately, no. Um, uh, very unlikely. Um, and I can, I can say in the case of the state prison, no, because um, my colleagues who are in state government records um, have actually physically toured that place and talked to people over the years. Um, they were there in the 1990s or again in the 2000s. And unless there's some, that's a big place. So maybe there's like a trap door or something under a piece of carpet that has a secret room or there's some old records they missed somewhere um you know uh, those those older things anyway uh things before the 1950s they're just gone i mean they're they're they were either destroyed with our approval or without our approval um you know i'm sorry to say it i mean i you, there's no harm in contacting Wapon to, uh, uh, but they will almost certainly uh, direct you right back here. And what we have is what we have. If it's more modern, if it's like in, since the 1960s or something, I, you know, that's the case with Mendota too. Those those records, they might very well could still have them there. Um, and the the other thing I told you about how records became centralized after the 1940s. We have some microfilm case files from the 1940s forward. So some of the people who were at Wapan in those more recent years are going to be in those central case files. Again, though, the microfilm, some chunks of the microfilm, we have 100% of the records. Some of the paper case files, I hate to, I almost has hesitant to tell you this, but those records, because they're so bulky, we back, not me, so don't blame me, okay, but my state records colleagues back in the 1980s decided that we have no space to store these things, these huge piles of paper records. So we're only going to be able to keep one out of every 10. So the, we would, we would just take one out of 10 and, and, and the rest were, were definitely destroyed the nine out of the 10. Now, as a public services person like me, it's like I'm horrified by that, but I also understand the, the reason for that and the decision that they made at the time. That's not an issue anymore so much because they're all digital anyway. That, that raises a whole bunch of other problems, like how you store digital stuff and how you keep migrating it forward into a format that works and how it doesn't become corrupted and all that other stuff. Huge challenge for us, even more of a challenge in some ways. But those old records are, are, I understand why my forebears decided to do that because they would have been overwhelmed and they had no, not enough staff to deal with it. And the agencies themselves were not going to, couldn't keep the stuff. So there you go. That's the, that's the horrible answer um, behind it. So the stuff we have for those early years, for sure, be 1950s forward. That said, I've told you before that I don't know that for a fact for every agency. So you know, some of them still probably have stuff squirreled away, especially those counties could still have it. So I don't claim to know that, but the state prison, I'm pretty confident of, um, but still contact us because the stuff we do have is pretty good. Even for those years where we don't have case filed, it's pretty good stuff. It can be pretty good, pretty informative. Yeah. Our next question, um, they have an ancestor who is at the Peshtigo Asylum in Marinette. Um, Peshtigo obviously has closed. So is, they're wondering, is there any way to obtain a copy of his records because he died at the institution in 1930? Mm. Yeah, that's one that, so Peshtigo is, I'm assuming, not on our list, right? I, I can't think look it at was, it. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so that's probably that same, same answer to um, contact the county uh, health department first. Um, see if they they retain the records even though they closed the place and they very well may have 
um, and then the, the local historical society. And as far as access goes, even though they're restricted now, how far do I want to go into this? I don't want to go into it really far, but by statute, as the state archives, I can provide access to records that are 75 years and older in some cases. So in that case, with a, with a, with a record like that, I could provide access, except that's a county record and that doesn't count. So for some counties, we have over the years negotiated agreements with, with the individual county. So for Dane County, for example, that Dane County Asylum, we have a written agreement with Dane County that says we can provide access after 75 years, the same way we do with state records. <sighs> So some counties have been willing in the past to provide access to records. 1930 is 90 years, 91 years ago, and the person is dead and you can show they're dead. So I think there's a decent chance that if you contacted the county and they still have some records and you plead your case and said, this ancestor died, here's an obituary, whatever, in 1930, you can probably talk them into providing access. And in one angle you can use is one, I mean, the family history should be enough, but you could also say that you're worried about medical history and medical conditions and things like that. That's a good angle. The last resort is if a county says no, and e this is even true with other things that are, that are even more recent than 75 years. If it's if it's a newer record, I, I tell people if you can get a, a judge's order. Now, you got to go to the county where the record, so go to the Pestico County it's Pesco County, right? Or Econo County? Marinette. Marinette County. So, yeah, you go to Marinette County uh, Court and you talk, send, make the same case to a judge. I've had people send me copies of orders they've gotten from judges that say, and they made the case, hey, I'm looking at the family medical histories, this person, I just want to see whatever records they have. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily a death record or anything, but you know, and it's more recent than 75 years, I've had judges say, okay, and, and send me an order and I can provide access the same way a county would have to provide access, but it has to come from that county where the record was created uh, if, it was a, if it was the Marinette County Institution um, in Peshtigo. So um, even if they stop you or if they say no, you might have the avenue of trying, if you're really persistent, you know, and, and I've run, you know, I've, I know some dogged, persistent genealogists that have gone the route of getting a court order, you know, to get whatever he got. So, there you go. So someone wanted to clarify. She said, if someone was admitted to Mendota in 1939, 1940, would you be able to release that information to them? Because that's over 75 yes. years. Yes. Okay. Yes, I would. Perfect. Um, the, our next question, someone is trying to research someone in an insane hospital in Mississippi. Um, so the 1920 census listed them as living there and that his occupation was a laborer in a sawmill. Um, she says she tried to email the hospital but got no answer. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for her on how to find more information? So it sounds like uh, he was a worker there as opposed to a staff member as opposed to a um, patient. Is that right? It's not clear. It says that the person was, was listed as a laborer in a sawmill, um, but okay. that they were also in the insane oh, hospital. Oh, okay. So maybe they were a, maybe they were so. a patient there too. Well, it could be either one. So, um, I would say I haven't dealt specifically with Mississippi, but the other part of that sort of record keeping universe. So, one question I would ask is: Is that asylum county? Is it state, or is it? a um, private hospital. I mean, it's possible it's a private. I'm assuming it's a state, probably a state hospital maybe. So here's the, here's the questions I always ask. If it's state, then there's, you could, the records for something like that could still be at the institution. But if it's like us, they could have also been transferred if they're old enough, if they're that old, to the state archives of Mississippi. So if you type in Mississippi State Archives, they may have records from that have been transferred, just like we have records from Mendota that were transferred. Mendota's still there. They could have kept things, but the way the system works in most states, if it's a state-run facility, then eventually they don't want to keep all those records going all the way back to 1850 or whatever it is. They transfer them or they destroy them. But if they were transferred and saved, they would. the system usually is that they go to the state archives for that state. So we're the state archives for Wisconsin, Mississippi, certainly has its own state archives. Whether it's part of a historical, system, it's probably not like us, it's probably not part of a historical study, it's probably more just a state archives, like a state agency. 
The other possibility is that there are state agencies that are related to medical and healthcare, like Department of Health and Family Services. Wisconsin has a Department of Health and Family Services, and they have some, they're the ones that have case files for kids that were at the state school for dependent children. So that institution closed. We are the state archives, but instead of some of those records coming to us, some of them did, but instead of the adoption records coming to us, the state kept those in the state um, Department of Health and Family Services. It's still part of the state universe, but it's an exception to the state archives rule. So, you know, you've tried the institution. If it's a state, try the state archives. So search for Mississippi State Archives, see if you can find a contact there. And if you're lucky, that state archives is staffed with people that are trained as archivists or librarians because they're people that are trained to try to provide access and try to give you some clues in ways. If you get somebody there who's just like a clerk or something, they might not be as sympathetic, but the librarians and archivists, as you know, are very sympathetic to genealogists, right? So if that fails, then you could try like Mississippi Department of Health or some like state agency like that. That's if it's state, if it's county, it's also still possible in Wisconsin county records do go to the state archives. So it's still possible that a county record might've been transferred to the state archives. So still try Mississippi state archives, but that's also another place where you try the county government for, you know, you try the county government that's still there. Whatever department is in charge of health and family services or welfare, that kind of thing. Most counties have something like that. Then you try the local historical societies around there. If it was a county run thing, if nothing else, you'll get probably some retired you know, local historian or genealogist who those are the people that work at those local historical societies and they may have gone down this path before they may know something. So those are, those are, but you know, if you can't remember all that, that's, that's, if you emailed me, that's what I would tell you probably about that. Yeah. Great suggestions. I agree. Um, our next question, uh, they have a great uncle um, who was at the Wisconsin School for the Blind in Janesville around 1900, or yeah, 1900. Mm -hmm. um, she's wondering, would there be records av available from that school? Yes, possibly. Um, I don't get a lot of requests uh, for those because I think because a lot of people don't know they're there or, you know, that they're there or even think of it or, or know that their ancestor was there. Definitely send me an email though, because there are some for some years, and I just can't remember off the top of my head what they are. There are some in or student records, I guess you would say that for the school, school for the blind, for sure. Absolutely. So Great. I don't know how detailed they are. I don't remember. I don't think they're terribly, but they're at least something that would tell you the dates they were there, maybe something about why they were, you know, what what their time there was like. Um, so definitely send me an email. Yes. Awesome. Our next question, is it expected that the elderly institutionalized um, would be in county or state where they lived or had family, or would they have crossed borders maybe um, for that type of care, do you think? They could have. Um, in, in fact, that's fairly common for in all these institutions. So let's say you're in Dunn County or something, and either your county doesn't have the right kind of care facility or they're full, or there's some other problem, there were patients that went to nearby counties. So you might've gone to Chippewa County or you might've gone to Eau Claire County Institution. Um, there's plenty of evidence of that I've seen in the county records of people from neighboring counties being transferred. It's part of that big system I was telling you about where you could go to the state, be transferred to the state institution, back to the county, maybe from county to county, it does happen. Now, yeah, what would happen is that if, Eau Claire County accepted somebody from Dunn County. They probably had a register where they kept track of that and they would charge, Dunn County would still have to pay for it. But those are cases where because the facility they had was full or because it didn't have the right kind of treatment or care or whatever other reason, they were transferred uh, from time to time or they would be sent to a neighboring county. It's definitely possible. Someone was wondering, do you need uh, volunteers to research or help with indexing? Because it sounds like you guys, um, yes. we yes. would love to have more indexing available. <laughs> yes, 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 for sure. Um, yeah. And we have, I had, I had, um, I didn't mention these, but we have pardon records, which are fantastic pardon case files. So some, every once in a while, you'll run across a prisoner uh, in the state system and it says they were pardoned on a particular date. Well, we have case files going all the way back to the 18th. 30s actually so territorial days before there was even a state prison with governor pardons and um, some of those are fantastic they'll be like letters from friends and family saying why somebody should be pardoned or why they shouldn't be pardoned or you know there'll be like you know documents 
so that the governor could review the, the details of the case. Some of those are really thick, some are fairly thin, but anyway, we had up until 1957, there are thousands of people in those files. We had no index. All we had, are, they were by date. And then kind of alphabetical, but not really. But you would have no way of knowing anybody was in there. I've had two volunteers. Unfortunately, they had to stop their work because of COVID and they hadn't start, haven't started up again. But I had two volunteers who came in for probably a year and a half, well, about a year maybe. And they got through from 1830s all the way up to the 1930s. So they did a hundred years wow. worth of these. They have a data, they created an Excel spreadsheet that has thousands of entries. And so at least the, the goal is once it's finished, once it's all the way up to 1957, that's where the other database starts. We're going to put it on our website and people will be able to find right away. You can search for a name and see if there's a pardon file, but um, it's sort of on a hiatus right now. Uh, but that's exactly the kind of thing, you know, we had a couple of volunteers and they were asking what they could do to help. And that's what they decided. They came in, each came in like once a week and spent a morning, you know, it can be tedious. I mean, I'm sure you've probably done this before. The other, the other caveat is there are ways we're working on ways to crowdsource this kind of thing. So you could do it from home. But right now, like the thing that the, the, the problem with the pardon thing is these are all paper files. So to index them, you really have to be here in person and looking through the paper files. But if you're interested in that, send an email to that Ask Archives email. And I, there's a volunteer coordinator that's one of my colleagues, and I'll forward you to them. And they can work with you about setting up some times when you can come in and, and do some work. That said, I'm sure, you know, those, um, if you have a local area research center there, I know that, again, Deb Anderson and Josh Ranger, I told you that they have court indexes there. Well, the, how they got those was they had peep volunteers come in and go through those court records and create indexes. So that's how those are created because none of these places, including us, have the staff to do that ourselves. So yes. um, love volunteers to come in. Absolutely. So do we. So anybody, even if you're not local to Madison, you know, and you have a need to volunteer or want to volunteer, libraries, archives, museums, they would love to have you. So offer up your services <laughs> anytime. <laughs> Our next question is wondering if you have staff, um, like employment or other type of records for the Mendota State Asylum. Um, she said one of her ancestors was the matron slash head registered nurse at Mendota starting in 1906. Personnel files are another one of those tricky things for us because over the years, just like medical case files, we haven't usually haven't accepted them even when they're offered partly for liability and privacy reasons, I'm guessing that, and also because they're bulky. Um, but that said, Mendota is a state institution. And at the very minimum, we have a set of employee roster card, or basically their employment cards for every state employee in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I don't remember how far back they go. Uh, I know at least to the 19 teens or 20s, maybe longer. So it's a massive, as you can imagine, set of index cards. And I think probably for the 1990s, they're still in paper cards. And, and, and that's when I started here on permanent staff. So I'm sure I'm on those cards. Uh, you know, you could look up my name and see that I was hired as an archivist at the Historical Society. And um, the same way that if somebody was there in the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, maybe before, but I'm not sure. Uh, if you sent me an email, I could try to look through those um, in those employee roster cards. What it would say is like the dates of employment, the different positions they held, their wage rates, you know. Um, so it's just an index card, but it does give you an outline of their employment. It's not a personnel case file, though, that has, you know, they got awarded for, you know, here's a copy of their 10-year service plaque or they were written up for making copies when they should never, I don't know, you know, whatever is in a personnel file, probably not a lot of that much interesting, but some basic stuff because they were a state employee. I don't think our Mendota records themselves from the, the institution, I don't think there are really employment records in there. I'd have to take a look, but I could check. Um, there's, they tend to be, the administrative records tend to be the higher up level. So like if they were the superintendent or the assistant superintendent or the person who took care of the top person who took care of the finances of the hospital, there's a lot of management records in there, like how they manage the place, but not as, and, and some people might turn up in the superintendent or assistant superintendent records. Like sometimes you'll see mixed in there, like somebody's resume or something because somebody wanted to get a job, um, but they're not alphabetical like that. They're just by date, you know? So uh, that's again, a long answer, but if you sent me, um, because it's a state institution, any, anybody who's an employee of the state, 
not just an institution, but they worked for DOT or they worked for DNR or whatever, going all the way back as far as at least the 19 teens or 20s, um, I can look them up and at least get maybe a basic employment record. Very cool. Um, our next question, why would my great aunt, um, who was in four different insane asylums over 20 years, be moved so many times? Well, it could have to do, it, it's hard to say, you know, again, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a medical historian or, you know, this is a caveat, you know, I, I can only tell you from my looking at these records over years, my sense is, I, I mentioned before that sometimes um, patient loads varied from county to county and they had to move some patients because of an influx of new patients um, and they weren't ready to be discharged yet. So they had to move them to a different place, either the state or to another county nearby. Let me give you an example. One I, I witnessed was um, some hospitals were overwhelmed after World War I, you know, um, some insane, some of these asylums because returning soldiers had shell shock and there weren't good resources for soldiers coming back in, 19, in, in, in 1918 and 1919 who might have been shell shocked or had some psychological problems because of their war service. So suddenly there were a bunch of young men who were sent to um, local asylums because of symptoms they were, and then that puts pressure on those asylums that are over full and they either have to discharge some people or maybe maybe the next county doesn't have uh, as many, so any, many people there. So they, you know, it's a network. So they can transfer them to a nearby county or even further away sometimes. Sometimes it happens further away. I've had similar people sort of as how did my aunt who was in this county end up so far away? And it could just be that was the nearest place they weren't ready to be discharged. And that was the nearest place that had available space for them. Just, you know, we're dealing with that with COVID right now with, with hospitals that can't mm -hmm. locally, they can't uh, take people and they transfer them to another town because they have to find the space where they can, right? Yeah. That's one explanation. I, I don't I don't know that that, that particular circumstance, um, what was going on, but, um, you know, if, if another possibility, maybe, maybe you've already ruled this out, but let's say the nearest family member, the husband or the wife or the parent or whoever was the guardian, maybe they had to switch guardians because one person couldn't be guardian anymore because of some personal circumstance or whatever, or because uh, that guardian moved to another town. And they, so they moved the patient too, because they wanted them to be closer. So there could be reasons like that. If the family members or whoever was the primary caregiver or the primary guardian moved as well. Maybe it was at their request. Maybe they weren't happy with that one place too. That's another possibility. I don't know. Sure. I'm spitballing here, guessing. <laughs> you know. uh, our next question. Uh, my great grandma and her siblings were at the Rochester Orphan Asylum in New York in 1892. Would there possibly be a court record of kids being dropped off there? Um, I'm assuming since it's an orphan asylum, there'd be some sort of record. Yeah, there very well could be. Is, is the Rochester, the, again, my first questions are, who's running it? Is it the state? Is it the county? Or is it private? Is it like a church or a private? Um, and they probably all had different requirements. You know, state institutions had a requirement. Uh, I mean, probably followed the, the law pretty closely as far as taking on children. Although the further you go back, that gets looser and looser probably, but probably was a requirement for a judge's order or, a you know, being committed. Um, you know... I do know though, I mean, you all probably have seen this. I've seen many cases where, especially in the 19th century, kids, you know, if it's an institution, again, a private institution is probably a little different, maybe a little less accountable, especially in the 19th century, the state is gonna be probably following these rules about commitment. But I've clearly seen cases, I know of a case in my family tree, and I think it was very common for a child maybe a child whose parents die or, or, or maybe one of the parents dies and the other parent can't take care of them or even more than one child. And they're just taken in by a relative, mm -hmm. maybe even a friend, but sometimes a relative locally. And they just start appearing on the census as a member of their family. Sometimes they'll say adopted, or even though there wasn't a formal adoption, they'll just call them our adopted daughter. I have one case in my family, the case is there was a son who was in his 20s who fathered a child out of wedlock. The married woman who gave birth to the child couldn't take the child. So the child was taken in by my ancestors' parents who were, who were actually the grandparents, but she's listed as a daughter in the census. 
because they took her in, but there wasn't any court. They didn't go to any court to do that. They didn't sure. get a, like a judge's order or something. They just did it. And nobody, and you could do that. People, it's harder to do today. Um, and it, in more modern times, I feel my gut feeling is that probably those, pri I don't have any private institutional records like that here. So I can't tell you for sure, but my guess is that they were more likely, be more likely, even a church would be more likely to take in an orphan without going through that court proceeding. If it was back in the 19th century, if it's a state or county institution, almost probably much more likely that there's going to be a court record. If, I, I'll, like, if you don't know, you know, so the first place to start is where, you know, who is the, who, who runs that place? State, county, private, and then religious, and then think about how the process might have worked and where the records might have ended up. And then if you, if you really strongly suspect that there was an adopt, that was possibly a kid committed, you could try going the court record route. Again, the, the trick there is that there's, they're probably, they're considered guardianships and they're, and courts are going to, they're kind of restricted. So you don't want to have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops if you don't have some good idea that there's something there, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So. Um, a question related to the Wisconsin Home for the Feeble-Minded, um, which was in Lafayette Tom, mm -hmm. uh, Township. Um, she said they had the, their own cemetery. Um, wondering if they have, if you guys have those cemetery records, or um, she said their their staff had no records and find a grave turned up nothing for that cemetery. Yeah, we might. Um, I, that's one of the ones I thought. Again, I I don't have my my search screen up here, but I I thought that was one that we might have some some death or maybe some burial record. It's definitely worth contacting Ask Archives at wisconsinhistory.org. I'm really digging myself in here now. <laughs> but that's, that's fine. That's great. It might take me a little while, but there might, I, I can't remember right now, but I, I think it's worth asking us. Uh, you know, you've already tried there. That's a great place to try. Um, I don't know. That, so they haven't even done like a transcript, transcriptions of the tombstones or anything like that. Um, but, but often at these institutions, and I think that's one, we at least have death records if, and the death record might say, they'll usually will say body sent back home or body, you know, buried on site or whatever. It'll have a note about whether it's at least, whether the person was buried there or sent home. And I'm almost certain that we have some, some death record, like for some years, whether it covers your ancestor, I don't know, but, but send me the email because uh, that, that's, that's a chance. And that, and that's a common, I think that's, that's generally how those state and county institutions operated. They all had local burial grounds. And then what they were supposed to do was record a death. They had to apply, you know, they had to apply for the death certificate. They might have a stub or like some sort of form they filled out. And then that usually indicated the process was if the family could afford it, they would send the body home. That was the first choice. If not, and nobody claimed it, they would bury the person on site there or, or their ashes as you, as you, you had that example. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they're, they're, there definitely was a record at one time. The, did it survive and did it end up with us or, or is it still at the institution? That's the big question, but, but send an email. All right, our next question. How would you find TB records in the mid 1880s? Ooh, tuberculosis, yeah. So, so those sanitarium records. Oh boy, another, another tough one because, um, well, if they happen to be at one of those two sanitariums that I showed you and we happen to have those years, you could try us. Um, those are on that list, the handout with those. I don't remember the two counties. The state sanitarium, we have record. There was a state, it was the same kind of system. They had county hospitals, the state hospital. They transferred people around. Um, but then there were the private hospitals. There's no central registry, unfortunately. And that's a case where I don't think, unless they required a judge's order because there was a question of payment involved, like the county, they needed a county, there could have been a process in some, at some years where the judge, where the court had to send somebody there in order for the county to agree to pay for care. But I think that's a case where it's more likely um, that, you know, if, if a family couldn't afford a private, if they could afford a private hospital, that's probably what they refer. Otherwise the person would go to the county um, and then, or, and or the state, and they might be transferred between them, depending. Maybe it's a matter, matter, again, a matter again of space available, the treatment needed, whatever. But there's no one place to look for that. Um, we have records from the state sanitarium, but I probably said we don't really have patient records from there. So I, I, I have nothing. To, I have no way to look. You know, if they were at one of those two places, we have records for. I could, I could maybe look at both of those. Um, and I, I, I think there's less likely there'll be a, a court trail for that. 
So that's a tough one. And the private ones are almost all gone, probably. You know, it's the yeah. same thing as hospital records. Uh, those are probably all gone. Um, newspapers, again, you mm-hmm. know, I, I, those local newspapers, if it's in a bigger city like Appleton or Madison, that's a lot of papers to look through. And they're less likely to mention it. But those smaller towns, I read through my, my ancestors. I have my mom's side family spent decades in Pulaski, Wisconsin. They, have a, they had a local paper for many years. I just took, spent my, some days off, hours, just going from front to back and just reading through them. And I can tell you almost every paper mentioned some member of the extended family in some way for some reason. And that's one thing they will mention is that somebody went away to the sanitarium at Pineview or in, you know, in, in, in um, Wales, Wisconsin or whatever. They, they're any little thing that happens, they're going to put it in there. That's that's a lot to do, but it might be worth you know spending if you have the time. It's I found it to be fun too, actually, to read through the paper. It gives you a real sense of what's going on in the town, and in a small town, if you have people in small towns, I can't recommend it enough because all you have to do is spend a couple of days doing that, and you can find a list of things to look for. You know that might yes. you might not have known about. You know. Yeah, or if you're fortunate like me, they have a lot of Oconto County ancestors. There's the Digitize Oconto County site, which is amazing. I spent yeah. so many hours on there looking at stuff in the newspapers. It's great. Yeah, so. more power. Keep clamoring. You know, tell tell us, tell the people who do our digital work here that we want more newspapers digitized yes. because I want them all digitized because they're, they're a gold mine for a whole bunch of different reasons. And I just wish I have ancestors from Green Bay and that one's a big black hole for me. And I have, I have O'Connell uh, ancestors too, and I didn't actually realize that O'Connell County had some, I'm going to have to go look and go looking there, Little River yeah, in O'Connell. the Historical Society um, di- has digitized a ton and are still digitizing a ton. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to go looking for that. Yeah. Um, our next question is about um, the Brown County Poor House. Um, so they have a relative in there in 1860. Um, they're wondering, how did poor house keepers get those jobs? Because apparently the, um, this ancestor was the keeper of the poor house. Oh, interesting. Boy, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, again, you, you want me to speculate a little bit? I could speculate <laughs> based on, based on how... Did you say 1860s? Yes. Early? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 1860s. So based yeah. on my experience, again, seeing records from the 1860s and reading about that time period, so I, just take this for a grain of salt. If any of you know that I'm absolutely wrong here, pipe right in the chat and say, that's wrong. That guy's, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just guessing here. But my feeling is that 1860s, it was likely a job that you could get because you had some connections, like the the say it's a county run institution and the county supervisor or whoever, you know, whoever's in charge of hiring has a, an uncle that wants a job. That's how like things like postmasters and that was like patronage was big, was really big back in those days, meaning that getting jobs for your family and friends, if you had the power to give government jobs. So a lot of jobs happened that way. I could tell you for sure, almost certainly that in 1860, you did not have to be qualified in some way. Like you didn't have to have some education related to help managing welfare, ed, you know, or caseworking or medical experience or anything like that. Um, that, you know, that's exactly why in the 19 teens and twenties, the state, Wisconsin, you know, the progressive er, during the progressive era, they reformed a whole bunch of things like that. They created a civil service process. They started licensing. I mentioned those licensing records. That's the reason they did that because they wanted in some professions, people to be a little bit more qualified than just whoever you wanted to hire. And also the civil service was meant to take care of that patronage problem. That thing of like, well, yeah, I know my uncle knows nothing, has never, knows nothing about medicine, but I'm going to, I'm going to appoint him the county coroner. You know, you could do that and you could still, in some states, you can still do that, but, sure. but um, you know, somebody has no qualifications at all. So my guess is that they, they either, either they just called out for applications or that person had a connection in county government, heard about the job and got hired or appointed because they had a, some sort of in or a connection. They knew somebody um, because those jobs are great. I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying great specifically to work in a poor house, but I'm just saying that government jobs then and today, you know, there's some appeal to them, steady, reliable, you know, they didn't have pension system like they do now, but it's still, it's a job, you know, and, 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 I, and I have a feeling that's probably what, that would be my guess. But, uh, you know, Brown County, uh, Green Bay, Green Bay Area Research Center, I think they have those Brown County records there, I'm pretty sure. 
Um, I think they're on that list. Aren't they poor houses and signs to say Brown County on there? That would be UW Green Bay Area Research yes. Center. Deb, Deb, I'm sure knows those, Deb Anderson knows those records inside and yes, out. And absolutely. usually when we have patient records or inmate records, we also, it's possible, we also have administrative records. So there really actually could be, if you look through those 1860, if they have like the superintendent of the poorhouse, his, that person's correspondence or something, I mean, it seems like a long shot, but it's possible. We have institutional record, like for the state of sanitarium, I have the superintendents, we have the superintendents correspondence for a big chunk of years. And if you have an idea roughly of when somebody started working there, I, I wouldn't be surprised if in there, if you cut, went through those letters in date order, you might find a letter saying, I heard you have a job opening. You know, I, I'm interested in, in, in that job. You might have a letter from your ancestor applying for it or a letter, some documentation. I have no idea whether the Brown County stuff has that, Deb would know. Yes. All right. Uh, we still have about 10 more questions. So thanks everybody for hanging <laughs> in with us, but we'll get through yeah, them. No, no problem. No problem. Um, someone's wondering if you still have, um, or if you can still find arrest records from the early 1900s. Arrest records. Yeah, that's a whole nother part of the process. Um, so thinking about, you know, I have the, I showed you the Dane County Jail. Well, for somebody to end up at the Dane County Jail, they were probably arrested, maybe by a constable, maybe by a police officer. That's a whole separate set of records that police departments keep. We don't have many of those. It's very scattered. Um, for some small towns, again, it's hit or miss, and I have to search to know. You know, I could tell you that I, we have a small number of mug shots and arrest books for Madison from the 1920s and early 30s. Why we have just that little piece, I have no idea. But I have some Madison Police Department, and they have a mugshot. They have a little blurb about who they are, you know, height, weight, whatever, what we were convicted of, and their photos. They're like a photo book. They're mugshot books, and and but they're only for that like 10 year period. And I don't have them before. I don't have them after. Um, you know, I know that I, I think we have some small for some reason arrest records for Milwaukee that are related to women only, not men, but women. I don't know why, you know, why do we end up with that? I have no idea. So it's very hit or miss, but also hardly ever do we have arrest records. Uh, you know, I think again, it's, it's such a trend. You think of the volume of records out there for all the arrests made over the last yeah. 150 years. And I think that's the further down in the weeds you get like that, where the number of records are so great, the less likely that they were saved just for practical reasons. It's, you know, our, our rule of thumb now in the archives, when, when we decide what county records to take and what state, can you imagine the volume of records that the state of Wisconsin, all those agencies and employees in all the counties of Wisconsin, imagine the volume of records that are created every single day. And when you go back to the paper days, that's a piece of paper. Those are pieces of paper. So we've had to decide over the years what we're going to take and what we're not going to take. And usually we, we try to take the records that have, that aren't as voluminous, but have the most punch, to, you know, pack the most punch. The individual arrest records, like on every given day, I, I know somebody who worked at the Madison Police Department and they have thousands of reports every day filed by officers around the city. I mean, thousands and I mean, it's ridiculous. It's amazing. Every call, they get calls. They log every call that's made to the police department. Mm -hmm. And you just, just imagine, you know, the volume. So anyway, I'm just saying yeah. unlikely, but give me a try. You know, I mean, maybe we'll have something unlikely, but possible. Um, our next question is wondering if your manuscripts are listed in Nuckmuck. Yeah, they used to be. Um, I didn't know. I don't know if Nuckmuck still exists, but for years, when I first started, uh, that's that's how I, this is how I get my senior reference archivist title. I've been here long enough that I remember Nuckmuck, and I remember that it's a Nuckmuck is a National Union catalog of manuscript collections or something like that. Is that what it sounds right? N U C M C. Yeah. <laughs> and what that was was in the pre-computer days, um, institutions like ours and other big university collections and Library of Congress and others. I think it was actually managed probably by the Library of Congress maybe, or National Archives, probably the National Archives uh, managed it. People would uh, submit detailed sort of lists or inventories of their holdings. It would be printed in a printed catalog at first, like these multi volumes. And every year they'd come out with new volumes. So libraries like ours would have this big set of Nuckmuck holdings things. So when you wanted to try to find out does anybody have a manuscript collection, meaning again, a private papers of somebody? Like who has the 
Hey, here's the one I'll surprise you. Who has the Rod Serling paper? So if you're old enough, you might remember Rod Serling wrote the scripts for Twilight Zone. He hosted the Twilight Zone. He wrote the Planet of the Apes movie. So let's say back in the 1960s or 70s or something, you wanted to know, 70s, we'll say 70s. You want to know who holds the Rod Serling papers, because if, if anybody. So you would look in the Nuckmuck catalog and there'd be in, the indexes. You might have to look in multiple volume indexes. And, oh, you see um, uh, Rod Serling papers, C, volume five, page, whatever. You go to that volume and hey, what in the world? The Wisconsin Historical Society has the Rod Serling papers. We do. We have the Rod Serling papers, part of the film and theater stuff I was telling you about. So if you want to see original scripts for the Twilight Zone or the Planet of the Apes script, you can look at it here. But that's how you would find it. You know, then gradually they created these online catalogs and they created shared online catalogs like WorldCat and there's Archives Grid. When we first, when I first started here, we were moving to something called Arlen, which is Research Library Information Network. Yeah, I'm, I think that's probably it. But it was called Arlen, and that was like a really cumbersome DOS-based kind of shared catalog of all these big institutions. They moved from things like Nuckmuck, the printed thing, to shared catalogs. We then went to OCLC, which is what a lot of libraries use, and then we have a cataloging system called Alma. That's that, you know, but we still import records to, to OCLC. So worldcat.org is a way to search for instead of Nuckmuck, and our holdings are in there. Archives Grid is another shared archives database that universities around the world and archives around the world, bigger archives tend to have their holdings in. Ours are in there too. Ours are in Nuckmuck or were in Nuckmuck, but I don't know if there still is a Nuckmuck. If there is, or probably are still in it. I mean, they might draw from OCLC or some of those old, but any, all these online catalogs, you know, we're, we're part of all these shared catalogs. So if you search for, for Rod Serling in WorldCat or in Archives Grid, it would point you to the Wisconsin Historical Society. You could also search, you know, our online holdings. We're part of the university, library.wic.edu. Um, I should have showed you that, but I, you know, it already takes so long. So, I mean, I, I can't show you everything. <laughs> But library.wisc, library.wisc.edu, that has the library, University of Wisconsin catalog. All of our holdings are in there, at least described at a very sort of thousand foot level, you know, where it just tells you, you could find there that we have the Brown County um, Asylum records. If you type Brown County Asylum records or something in there, you would find them and then it would give you a description. There might be an inventory that it links to telling you how it's broken down, but it would also tell you that they're stored at the Green Bay Area Research Center. They're, we are, they're owned by us, but stored up there and they're in our catalog. So search our catalog, but also send me an email. Yeah, and I did Do put both. that link for the library catalog in the chat for people oh, thank who are you. interested. So thank you. All right, our next question, um, she said, one of my great grandfathers sustained a head injury from working in a railroad yard in Milwaukee County. She understands from family lore that he admitted himself to the hospital slash sanitarium slash asylum for Milwaukee County. And this was after 1927. Um, she says she already tried to look for his medical records with a signature of her grandma as the next of kin, but no uh -huh. luck. Do you have any hey. other suggestions? Um. Well, I don't, you know, I'm curious as to where, um, who she applied to for the records, um, if it was the county or the state again, um, probably the county, I guess Milwaukee County is probably, uh, the county definitely had its own asylum. Um, if you, you know, the two places I would say, you know, if she hasn't already done it is the current Milwaukee County Health Department, place number one, place number two. Milwaukee County Historical Society, because they are the official statutory archives of, of government records in, in Milwaukee. Between the two, I would actually defer to them as to where to try next, um, because I'm sure they've answered this question many, many times. The archivist at Milwaukee County Historical Society, that, you know, he's, he's one of us. I mean, he'll, he, uh, that staff will, um, they will have walked down this path many times. People will have asked about the asylum or the, you know, whatever the, the, the county run facility was that the person might've gone to. So they would be, um, you know, I mean, I'm assuming that too, that it wasn't a matter of them denying you permission. It was that they just didn't, couldn't find anything. They didn't have anything. And sure. that's not necessarily surprising. They might not, those records might not exist anymore, but, yeah. uh, you know, but, but if you haven't tried the Milwaukee County Historical Society, I would definitely recommend that. And if nothing else, just to get, if, see if they have any suggestions about that county because they're the experts there. 
All right, our next question. Um, someone's looking for records of someone who is listed on the 1920 census as being in the La Crosse County Insane Asylum. Um, so they're wondering, do you guys have those records or does La Crosse County, like Historical Society have those records? Yeah, that's another one. Uh, is, can you, are you looking at my, my handout right now? Can you tell me whether La Crosse is listed under the asylums and poorhouses? It is listed under okay. the yep. asylums that and would, hospitals. Yep, so that is that is almost certainly that will be at the UW, our UW La Crosse Area Research Center. So UW La Crosse, type in in Google UW La Crosse Area Research Center, and that is basically those are university archives at, archivists at those different locations. We have an agreement with them where we, like we have these, we own the historical society owns those records, but because they have to do mostly with the La Crosse area, and just between us, because we're always strapped for space, we have them stored up at La Crosse and you provide, provide access to people in the area. So contact them, they will have dealt with these records before, I'm sure many times. Um, I don't know what, what the patient records look like for that, but they definitely have some. All right, our next question. Um, this is an ancestor who was admitted to the Warren State Hospital in Pennsylvania in 1897 and died there in 1903. Um, she says she has newspaper articles announcing his commitment and death. So she's wondering how might she go about obtaining those records from the Warren State Hospital on his admission and death? Yeah, so again, the two places. Um, if, if that institution still exists, maybe it's under a different name. Uh, or even if not, you know what I would say is before you go to the institution itself, even if it exists already, try the Pennsylvania State Archives again. Because again, uh, as a state institution, almost I think every state I know of has a separate state archives and the process is records once they're old enough that the whatever the institution doesn't want them anymore, they get transferred. They're still under state custody, but they get transferred to the state archives. And um, I, I say start there because those people are more likely to be used to genealogists contacting them. And um, they will also know, tell you, they'll tell you, yes, we have some records, but they're spotty or whatever. Or they'll say, we don't have anything, but you could, you should try contacting the institutions now called the something else. You should try contacting them because I have many examples like that in this state where the old name of the place is now something else, but it still mm -hmm. exists. And um, Pennsylvania State Archives, try that. Yeah, I'm sure they, knowing their area better, would be able to better, you know, navigate you as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, someone is wondering about records from veterans from World War One and World War II, but of course, um, like you said, uh, a lot of those records were burned in the fire in St. Louis. Um, so she's wondering if there are copies of those records in state um, records related to like Veterans Association, yeah. um, or if there's any tricks that you have in finding <laughs> records that were burned in St. Louis. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I, I, I t must have touched oh, a sure. button on my, uh, I was adjusting my headphones and I hit a button that muted there. Sure. I'm okay now, right though? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so military records, yeah. Um, so uh, let me just run quickly through. There are, we have lots of collections of private papers of people that were donated to us. That's a, that's a much like one in a million thing, you know, like did, did we end up with letters and diaries from your ancestor? Kind of unlikely, but possible. Yeah. So that's one one thing. Um, World War One, as I said, we have copies of all the, the we have copies of the service records for Wisconsin soldiers who served in World War One, and that's because at the end of World War One, the state of Wisconsin decided they were going to give bonus payments to veterans and the veteran the families of veterans who might have died in the war. So they wanted to create a, have their own record of who officially served. So they got copies of the official service records for all of Wisconsin soldiers. And I, we have those here on microfilm. So for Wisconsin soldiers in World War I, I have a, we have a service record. We should have a service record here. So contact us and I'll try to find it. World War II, no, unfortunately. They didn't have a similar bonus program and we didn't make copies of the service records and those were mostly lost. Um, you know, there's a database, you probably have it at, at Appleton Public Library, maybe you're familiar with it, it's Fold3 that, that has yep. a lot of military records and military references in it. So maybe, you know, like draft records sometimes, like World War I, there are draft records on Ancestry. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes people will find the draft record. Uh, the only other thing that from World War II, other than private papers donated to us, is that we have some records of service, for service records for the Wisconsin National Guard. So if a person was in the Wisconsin National Guard and then activated for service in World War II, 
or between the wars or after the war or whatever. I mean, from like the 1860s, from Civil War up until the 1950s or 60s, we have service records for Wisconsin National Guard. And a lot of soldiers who served like in the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, they started off as being Wisconsin National Guard and then they were activated when the war started. We have a basic service record for all of them, all of them as well. Now there is a state statute restricting access to service, military service records too, um, but we've generally, we and the Wisconsin Veterans Museum who also has some collections, um, they have copies of some of the same stuff we have not the National Guard records, but they also have um, some private letters and, and family records. We've determined that for World War I and earlier, those are all open because once the soldier is dead, you know, we can provide access. So the, the years are sort of rolling forward where we just pretty much automatically provide access. And then let's say it's, it's World War II era, but you can prove somehow that the person is dead, we can probably get you access. But that only works for Wisconsin National Guard, the vast majority of World War II veterans, unfortunately, you can try those databases like Fold3 and you can contact the National Archives and see if they have any suggestions, but I, that's that's the best I can think of. Yeah, and definitely reach out to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum if it's a Wisconsin yeah. ancestor or even if it's not, Russ Horton is great. We've had him yep. speak before and we're going to have him speak again in April, so he's a treasure great, trove yeah. of information as well. Yeah, on, and they specialize in those military records, so they're, that's definitely check with them, yeah. All right, we have about 10 more minutes before the library closes. So we got to get, get these last questions. Yeah, they're going to kick me out of here, too. I saw the yes. lights go off in the hall out there. So, um, so this one is um, they're trying to locate a criminal course, court case from 1924 in Milwaukee County that concerns a family case. Um, she says she already checked with the Milwaukee County Historical Society, but they only have civil cases. Um, so do you know where criminal court case records from 1924 might be? I would try. I would, I would next go to the Milwaukee County Clerk of Courts. And I know that, let me give you, I, 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 I'm, I'm more familiar with Madison um, and the counties that we serve here, but in Madison's case or in Dane County's case, they still have all of their criminal court records. They've given us some of the things like civil probate and all that. They have kept, that Clerk of Courts has still kept all of their criminal case files going back to the 1850s. So they have, they still have them all there. So I wouldn't be surprised if Milwaukee does too. Um, maybe they already told you at Milwaukee County Historical not to not to bother. I don't know. But I, I would next try the Milwaukee County Clerk of Courts because no matter how old it is, criminal case files for some reason are something that counties have more often tended to keep themselves. I don't know if they think it's has more of a legal purpose or whatever. They don't want to get rid of them. I, I don't really know. Um, if you fail there, so you've tried Milwaukee County Historical and you fail at the clerk of courts. You can, it seems to me that we have a few scattered things for very early cases because before Milwaukee County became sort of formally the, the right place to go for Milwaukee County records, we did acquire some things and we do have some scattered Milwaukee County court records here at the, um, they're stored at UW-Milwaukee, but I have them in my, we have them in our catalog here. So, I mean, you could just go right to UW-Milwaukee archives. So that's a separate, they're like the area research center I was telling you about for, so try them. Or if you'd rather contact me, just, you know, and throw it on my pile, go ahead. <laughs> no, seriously, go ahead. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just joking. Go right ahead. I mean, I'll search too. But, but before you do that, try the Milwaukee County Clerk of Courts if you haven't already. Unfortunately, that's a giant county. So it might depend on who you get there. You know, yeah. some of those smaller counties, people are very help, helpful and very friendly and they don't have a ton of requests necessarily. And they'll go like extra lengths to help you find things. But I'm guessing Milwaukee County is a very, very busy one. And, and, yeah. and it might be hard to get somebody that that'll, that knows a lot and will help you. But. Give it a shot. Maybe persistence will be the key as well. There, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> All right. Our next question. Um, they have a child who was taken in in either Ohio or Indiana around 1840 by another family. Um, but she says there probably was no formal adoption um, mm -hmm. and the person kept their own family surname possibly. So they're wondering, might there be some other form of recogn recognition of them being adopted adopted by this family um, and other kind of records that you can think of. What year did you say it was? 1840. Oh gosh, yeah, probably not. I mean, maybe maybe something in church records, you know? I mean, um, maybe something in church records. Uh, you know, maybe some other sort of civil record, like a death record, or, you know, 
the, the trick, the problem there is that um, people obviously were not tracked the way they are now. Uh, I, one type of record I didn't mention that can be useful is there are name change records. So some counties have them, some county courts have them. Uh, UW Milwaukee Area Research Center, I know from experience, has a set of court records for name changes, but they just don't go back that far because people weren't required to do it in that early. You know, I mean, these are more 20th century, maybe late 19th century, but more 20th century kinds of records. Um, because back, you know, people, when they didn't have driver's licenses, they didn't have to show ID, they didn't have to get, have a W-2 form when they got a job. They basically, you could go into any town and just say, my name is Jim Smith, you know, yeah. and then go to another town and tell them your name is something else. And unless they recognize you, there's no verification or identity. So they just didn't, they're just not a paper trail. But I did want to mention name change records because not only are there some counties, but, um, the state vital records office, which we haven't mentioned yet, and I, you know, the state vital records office in Wisconsin has records, birth, death, and marriage records for and divorce decrees for the entire state. The advantage of going to them is that they have statewide indexes in a lot of cases. So if you're not sure what county somebody was divorced in, or you could at, check with them, the problem is they'd have a pretty small staff and they have, you know, they just have, they're limited in the service they can provide. And there's usually a fee, but I mean, beside all that, they have those statewide. They have name change records, I believe, as well, because especially in the modern, in the 20th century, because just like everything else, like birth records, whatever, when you did a formal name change, they have to they have to have a record of that because they have your birth certificate under the old name and there's a formal process for that. So I believe that the vital records office has name change records. So that's a common question I get too, that I, I think somebody was adopted and they changed their name. Did it, was it formal or not? Back in 1840, probably not. Yeah. Back in, you know, in the 20th century, probably maybe very likely, and there might be a court record or, or something at the vital records office that shows that. Other than that, I'd say church is probably for 1840 is probably your best bet. All right. Our next question is tapping into your map knowledge. Uh, how often are plat maps <laughs> generally redrawn? Um, in modern times for bigger counties, almost every year. Um, you know, I, I can tell you like in Dane, Dane and Rock and some of those counties every year, every other year, but the further you go back, the more infrequent it was. Um, in Dane County, first one is 1861, then it's 1873, then it's 1890, then it's 1899 and so forth. And there's, so there's like a, anywhere from an eight to 10 to 12 period, year period in between. Um, as you get into the 20th century, you know, 1950s forward, almost every year for Dane County. Um, and it, I guess it just depends on how populous the county is, how frequently, how frequently it changes, like smaller rural counties that don't have a lot of turnover. They might not, they might not have as, have as much. Um, I should mention to you, because it's not easy to find, our website, Wisconsin, www.wisconsinhistory.org. It's, uh, it's the, you know, part of my email address there with, uh, you just type in wisconsinhistory.org and go on the center of that homepage and say digital or Explore our collections. You choose that. And then on that Explore Our Collections page, there's a digital collect, there's a column in the middle of digital collections. Unfortunately, you have to go through all these steps to find it. But if you go down there and scroll down, you'll find digital our map collection. And our map collection has every Wisconsin County plat map and atlas before 1923 has been scanned. You can zoom in, read all the details. It's hard to find it. You can't just search our general website and find it. You've got to go explore our collections, and then that list of digital collections, find the map collection, go into there, click on browse the collection, then click on search, and then and then search for Outagamie County and at Platt, Outagamie County Platt, and you'll find all the Outagamie County Platt maps that are available that we have, and we have most of them before 1923, and the 1923 cutoff is copyright because of copyright, but little known I think too little known resource that is fantastic for, for looking yeah, at plat maps. I agree. I did not know that. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Jennifer was wondering if you knew what happened to Jean Ruth or baby Ruth that you talked about, did she graduate from college? Cause you know, I want to know. <laughs> I never looked at it. You know, I I'm right here on the UW campus and the UW archives here where they're separate from us. They have, they have student records for UW students um, you know what? I should ask them. I'm going to ask them next time yeah. I think of it, next time I see them, if they can look up. We want the happy ending of the story. They can look yeah. up Ruth and see if she graduated. Yeah. 
And Jennifer also did share a little bit more about um, Dilo Stoddard that you had shared earlier. Yeah. She said, wow, he had a cool life. He, he served in the U.S. Air Force for World War II, Korea, and the American War in Vietnam. He married, was living in Texas, and died there in 1977 from pain. Is that an ancestor? Cancer. Is that an ancestor? That's um, the guy that you were talking about earlier. The, yeah, I know. The prison but guy. but yeah. yeah, did it happen to be, how does she know so much no, about She just that's... was searching on ancestry. Oh, that's you know, fantastic. Because you piqued yeah. her curiosity. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I should have been, I should have looked into that too. I just sort of stopped yeah. with his, his uh, crime life, but, but, I, but actually that happens a lot, you know, I mean, especially during the depression, there are a lot of pr uh, people that were in prison for whatever circumstance they were young, they, they economically challenged, whatever it is, but they ended up turning things around and really having a, an amazing, you know, family and, and nobody ever knew about it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. Great, thank you for that. Just quickly, could you go through the map directions again? Um, somebody wants sure. me to post it in chats for Sure, them. sure. So go to our website, wisconsinhistory.org. Let me know when you're there. Yep. Now on the middle of the page, there's a, a series of colored boxes and one of them says, explore our collections. Okay. And then uh, on the center of the next page, there's a column, a vertical column listing digital collections. Scroll down alphabetically till you find maps or map and maps and atlases or something like that. You see that? Okay. Click on that. There's a couple of hoops that I would prefer were not there. Um, I wish you were there right now, but you have to click on browse the collection. I don't know if you see that. I'm just typing the direction. So hopefully they can oh, follow. Oh, okay, <laughs> I see. And then there's another browse button, which doesn't make sense, but to get to the search box to search for those maps, you got to go through like maybe two browse buttons or something like that. Um, you know, if you, if you have trouble finding it, just send me that email again. It might take me a while to answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. I can send you a link directly to it, especially if you tell me what county it is, I can send you a link right to that, those county maps. There's lots of other maps up there, by the way, there's thousands of Wisconsin maps, like highway maps, road maps. Uh, some of them do go past 1923. If they were state maps, there's, there's no copyright issues. So like the state DOT maps and things like that, there's railroad map, there's maps showing uh, small spur line railroads all over the state. There's bicycle route maps from in 1898. There's all kinds of great stuff in there. Yeah. Well, thank you once again. Wonderful yeah. presentation. The library is closing in four minutes, so we do have to wrap <laughs> up. And that was all of our questions, thankfully. So we timed this Excellent. perfect. And everybody well, thanks, is everyone. so appreciative of all your information and knowledge. And people are excited to meet you. You're like a local celebrity, it sounds like. <laughs> They're so thrilled with all your yeah, knowledge well. and they want us to have you back again. So Yeah, all right. Well, great. I'm happy. I'm happy that's that people stayed around and it wasn't over too uh, overwhelming. It's a long, it's a long, long time to be on here. Yes, thank it. you everyone for staying with us. And uh, we hope to see you again January 15th when we talk about genealogy programs. All right. All right. Thank Take you. Take care everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.